Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to another episode of Lord of the Collections. Uh, I'm your host, Valkyrst, and this is my co-host, Tyler Barrett Macklem. And uh, I have with us a very special guest uh, this evening. A man that uh, if you are a collector of Lord of the Rings uh, replicas, he uh, practically needs no introduction, especially if you collect uh, United Cutlery products. But for those of you who don't, or maybe some of that you do, but don't know who actually uh, designs and brings these wonderful replicas to life, um, here's the man himself, Kit Ray. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about himself. Kit? Hello, everyone. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll just start off and give a kind of a brief introduction on on my background and how I got into this crazy industry. Um, I guess it, it really all started, you know, when I was a kid, I was I was a uh, science fiction and Dungeons and Dragons nerd, you know, like most of my friends. So in my favorite books were Lord of the Rings and Dune, mm. which is crazy because now I'm working on replicas from both of those movie series. Uh, but I was into a lot of science fiction and Greek and Roman mythology. So I was always kind of into this stuff and always drawing. Uh, I wanted to have a career as an artist. So I was always drawing and painting things from books. And uh, naturally I would uh, draw the, you know, things like medieval warriors, but I was drawing my interpretations of Lord of the Rings swords and the swords and weapons from Dune when I was in high school. So uh, I was a big fan of artists like Frank Frazetta, uh, Boris Vallejo, uh, all the artists who did the cool book covers, like the John Schoner who did the Dune book covers. I mean, I was into all that type, that type of art. So those were my influences. Uh, and I started in the knife industry in the mid-1980s. I think it was 1983 or 84. Uh, There's a company called Smoky Mountain Knife Works in East Tennessee, that had a, uh, they had a showroom, but what they were is a mail order uh, knife company. And they, my father was in the newspaper industry and he actually printed their catalogs. So one thing led to another and whenever they needed some art done, I would kind of do that on the side, you know, like a blade etch for a case knife or something like that. Um, but anyway, the, the owners of the knife works and a couple of other companies, couple, uh, one of the, the bigger knife distributors in the country, they wanted to start their own company. And they did that, I believe, in 84, and that was United. So naturally, they called me in to do some work anytime they needed design work. But um, I think I started work for them. You know, when it, when it was obvious that was becoming a thing, I started work full-time for them about... Uh, 1985 doing uh, mostly graphic design, but I also started to get into product design. But anyway, that that kept going and going. And I thought, well, th this could be a career here, so I better learn what the heck I'm doing because I, had, I had, had no clue how you design knives, really. Uh, so I, I started lo looking into uh, knives from history, I started learning how to do CAD drawings, uh, learning everything I could about knife making at the time. You know, with no internet, you just had to go find books or find somebody who did that and just talk to them. Um, I learned about uh, how casting and injection machines work, how the tooling was made, uh, how grinding machines work, all the various plating finishes and process. So I spent about probably five years just learning all this stuff before I really thought I could call myself a, a proper designer. Uh, but once that got rolling, I was doing uh, design work for all the United lines. Uh, I did mostly functional sport and tactical uh, type stuff for brands like Harley Davidson, Smith and Wesson, Remington, Browning, Stanley tools, uh, rigid knives. Uh, I designed the whole Colt knife line for Colt the Gun Company in the 1990s. Um, but while I was doing all that, I was also doing all this wacky fantasy stuff, which didn't exist. I mean, it existed in the custom knife industry. You had guys like Gil Hibben doing this and his partner at the time, Paul Ehlers, who was his designer. He would design the stuff and then Gil would make them. But that was really the only place you saw something fantasy-like uh, that was more a piece of art than than something functional. 
Um, but I wanted to do that in our industry. So, so I started doing all this stuff, um, mostly knives. It was almost all knives, but, but, and we were calling them fantasy knives at the time. I don't think that term was really in use prior to that. Uh, but that, um, uh, so that was the late 1980s and into the, uh, early 1990s when that whole, that, that market was just kind of starting. That's kind of when it started to build, um, I, I created, I started putting my name on the products and it, and it, and, you know, one thing led to another. And I, I started having a following of people who just wanted, Hey, when's the next Kit Ray thing coming out? And I thought, okay, well, may I need, just need to continue doing that because that was the fun stuff that I liked doing more than the functional stuff. Uh, so I, I just kept doing that and I always wanted to get into swords. We hadn't really done swords other than uh katanas i mean katanas were huge in the in the 1980s you know these cheap stainless ones uh we didn't really have anything functional on the market at that time um but i always wanted to get into swords and somehow work my artwork my paintings into them and two of united's owners at the time uh kevin pipes there were four owners kevin pipes and uh david hall they were interested in going that direction too so uh one thing led to another. And so I started the, the Kate Ray fantasy art line in uh, 1997 or the swords of the ancients line is what people know it is. And it was originally going to be a line of 10 fantasy swords with companion art prints. And, but it got so big, I just kept going with it and it's still going now. I actually have a new sword coming out this year. Um, hopefully this year before the end of the year, if all goes well. Uh, so anyway, you know, so United kind of created that whole fantasy knife market, uh, back then. And we, you know, we kind of created a whole industry around it and it was huge. And then China came in and knocked everything off and oversaturated the market with knockoffs and kind of generic fantasy junk and killed it. So around 2005, it was pretty much done, but we had a good long run. Um, but so, so that that's kind of my background and how I got into this, uh, how I got in the, into the film replica business, which is my my day job is is functional, tactical, uh, just regular usable knives, functional, tactical, sporting type knives. Um, that's what I do now. But what I specialize is is in movie knife replicas. Um and how I got into that is how how United got into movie replicas was uh, goes way back to 1988. And custom knife maker named Gil Hibben called us up and he had just designed a knife for Sylvester Stallone. Uh, Rambo, Rambo knives were all the big rage, all those survival knives that, that were around at the time. That was huge in the market. Rambo 3 was being made. He, design, he was called up to design a knife for Stallone for Rambo 3, and it's this really interesting, unique-looking Bowie. And he was trying to find somebody who could make a production version of that. And so he called us up. So that was our first uh, movie license. And we ended up going back and, do, and doing the replicas from the first two films, but that, that Rambo 3 is what kicked it all off. And so we made that. It was a huge success. Uh, that led to dozens of other movie night licenses. Like um, there's so many, I can't even remember them all now. Um, Terminator 2, Mortal Kombat, Hellboy, uh, Stargate, Highlander, Indiana Jones, G.I. Joe. Uh, I, I worked on all the Blade film replicas. Um, yeah, even Game of, not the HBO series, but the Game of Thrones book series. I worked on a bunch of those swords. Um, yeah, like I said, I can't even remember half of them now. But mm -hmm. uh, so, so that was a that was a that was kind of my little uh, specialty that I did for many years. I got into uh, later on. I got into video game replicas like uh, uh, the Dark Sider Sword, God of War, Devil May Cry. Uh, some of them I can't even remember now. World of Warcraft, that's one we just did a couple of projects for Blizzard. We just finished up last year. Um, but anyway, so around, uh, you know, obviously the biggest replica line 
I was involved with and is, and still are is Lord of the Rings. I'm sure that's what most people tuning in here are going to want want to know about. Uh, a little background on that: we tried to get a license to do uh, Lord of the Rings book swords, just our designs based on the swords in the books. And we went to the Tolkien estate and tried to get that license around 1995. And a lot of those designs that I came up with that we pitched to the estate ended up being my swords of the ancients swords later on. So those all ended up getting made, but the estate turned us down. I think they'd already start, they'd already signed a contract with, uh, I believe it was noble collection. Do you remember that Val? The Hildebrand mm -hmm. brothers did. I, yep. There were two or three knives or, and swords they did. I remember they, they, their version of Glamdring was yeah. quite something else. <laughs> very, very bejeweled. Yeah. <laughs> so so that they, that had already been signed before we even sent our proposal. So we lost out on that. But then around, uh, I guess this was late 1999, New Line Cinema called us up. So we already had a reputation for building movie like movie. Uh, knife and sword replicas so they called us up and wanted to talk to us about the lord of the rings films which i'd heard about you know but nobody really knew anything at that time so we uh, made a trip to new york and we looked at these big binders of like three massive binders of fold of uh, photos of all the props the sets the costumes the weapons and I was kind of blown away when I saw that, you know, because up to that point, no one really imagined you could pull those films off that you could number one, follow the books and accurately and do something that, that was the essence of the books, but also make it look like something from that world. And looking at these binders of photos, I thought these guys know exactly what they're doing. These are fans of the books. And, and I was just kind of blown away with it. And I I think I was the biggest Lord of the Rings fan in the room. I don't know if any of the other people there had actually read the books, the licensing people. And I think one of the guys from United who was there with me had read Lord of the Rings. But, you know, I grew up with these, so I knew them inside and out. So I'm looking at them and I know, oh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that has to be Glam Dream. That's Ian McKellen's playing Gandalf. Um, as soon as I saw the, saw Andural, didn't know for sure that was Enduro. Then I flipped the page and I see the, the shards. Ah, that's an arsenal. So I'm seeing all this awesome stuff. And I'm trying not to get too excited because we don't have this license yet. Right. Um, but anyway, we ended up getting it. And, uh, you know, film film one was we, we had we were in the door early enough. Usually we when we do a film license, film's already done and you're called a few months before the release. You know, it takes a year to get these things made and get them on the market. So most of the time you get a film license, you've missed the, the whole market. You're lucky to get it when it came like back then, when it, when the VHS came out or the DVD came out. You know, now they come out three months after the movie. Back then it was like six months to a year after the movie. So we we were hitting the market whenever those came out. But you never get you never get the penetration in the market, the people that really want it because you always miss the movie release. So you're always tailing that. But we were in the door early enough to where, where we thought, okay, we can probably get a product on the market by the time the film comes out. And that was going to be Sting. Uh, but we made a decision that to do uh, Sting, Glamdring, and I think it was the Witch King Sword were the three we started with. And I believe we actually hit the market with Sting. I think we actually had that shipping when the film came out. I don't think the other two were. Uh, but that, so that's, that's kind of how the whole thing started. And, uh, you know, in my mind, I thought we'll be, usually you do one product, you get a film license, you're doing one product and then you're done. And I thought sting, it'd be great. If the film is good, we might do two. We might even be able to do three, <laughs> you know, but yeah. we knew there was film two and three coming out. So in my mind, I'm thinking, well, there's a lifetime, there's a span here where the collectors are going to be interested in it. So we might be able to do three products, you know, and now whatever we are, 24 years later, 
I think there's probably over 50 products that I've done in the line and we're still doing them. It's just, yeah. it's amazing how long it's lasted. And it's, it's just due to the, the fan base and the collectors like you guys and me, I'm a collector, obviously. Uh, we, we've just kept it going and hopefully we'll keep going. I, mean, I hope I'm still doing this when they nail the box shut and put me in the ground. <laughs> It's uh, right it's crazy to think that we owe, potentially we owe the the Lord of the Rings United Cutlery replica line to Rambo 3. <laughs> 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 yeah. Who would have thought? If that, if that license, you could also say you owe, it's owed to Gil Hibben because of Gil Hibben. Right. And I, I worked, that's another thing I, I did is... United did a lot. They did that Rambo thing. And then we did a, a license with Gil to produce replicas of his knives. And, and I ended up working with him and designing and, and a lot of that stuff and helping replicate his designs. But if he'd never made that call and we never got that license, I have the feeling we would have eventually gotten some type of film license. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you think back, if he had not, if he had not contacted us about that Rambo three deal, what if that door never opened? Somebody else would have gotten it, or it may have never happened. I don't. I. It was. It was just like a a series of the right events happening at the right time for everything to fall into place. Yeah, like right. they just happened to get a guy who worked for the company that knew the books inside and out. So I kind of knew when we started, uh, what where we were going, what we needed to do, and you know, if I didn't work for you, whoever got the license, you may, if they had somebody who didn't understand the books and didn't really know the property, then it might've been a little short lived line of three or four, three or four knives or swords. Uh, but mm -hmm. it just worked out perfectly. And it's like I said, I'm still amazed that I'm still doing this. It's like my favorite book as a kid, my favorite two books, Dune and Lord of the Rings. And I'm working on that stuff weekly. Yeah this far down yeah. the line that's pretty cool well i think i speak for all of us in the collector fan base and uh, to say that i'm incredibly grateful we are to everything that you've brought well and i'm i am grateful Along all these and years they, and, uh, they keep me employed for all these years yeah yeah even with the uh, united eventually um changing hands and you sticking through with that to, to sort of steer the ship with your knowledge because I'm sure they were they weren't sure what to do at some point and uh, needed a steady hand to kind of guide them and like just the vast think, amount of knowledge that you've carried over from those years. Like as you talk about it often enough on the UC forums, like you've forgotten more stuff than. You. Oh yeah, I, I'm yeah, sure. Then, I, I'm sure I've forgotten half of the stuff I posted on UC forums. Exactly. Once it gets but, to the, the uh, yeah. past that twenty year mark, the filing cabinet's full, and <laughs> like yeah. you. You'll probably ask me something in this and I won't be able, I won't remember. Um, that instant recall is gone. Five minutes mm -hmm. from now, I think, oh, that I know the answer to that question you just asked. Yeah. My brain is like looking through the files. Oh, here's that thing you were <laughs> just trying to find. Yeah, exactly. I'm at that point now where I can't remember half of the stuff I did 20, <laughs> years, let alone 10 years ago. <laughs> so, Kit. What is, I'm sure a lot of people would be really interested to hear this and would maybe help them understand uh, a bit about the, the prop replica collecting hobby. But so, what is the process involved in bringing a prop replica from the drawing board at UC or your drawing board to my wall or, you know, shelf? You know, how, what is the pro, how does that, what does that look like? Um, well, it, it all, it obviously all starts with the prop or photos of the prop in the case of Lord of the Rings, we, most of the props we had, um, we acquired those as the production was going on because we were lucky enough to uh, be in ahead of time. I mean, they'd already finished most of the, most of the principal photography, but they still had another two years of filmmaking to go uh, with all the pickups. So we, they were actively making props at the time. So we got in the door early enough to get those props um, not not the initial launch, but later on, I mean, we ended up getting something like 22 or 23 props uh, from Weta during the production. So 
Uh, but that's where it starts is you, you have a prop and we will, we would take that photograph it every angle you could do every measurement we could, um, uh, you know, if it had a specific color of leather on the handle, then we're getting the PMS color for the leather. Just everything we could from the prop, we'd get that down. Uh, then we would, uh, I would look at it from an engineering standpoint and look at what can we do and what can't we do. So you, you have to look at uh, anything in the hilt design that is not manufacturable. You know, the, these are... We're building injection molds and steel casting dies, and we're using machine grinders. So everything has to work in the process that we have already. We, we, we're not custom, I mean, we're not Peter Lyon. We can't do a, a handmade sword. We can't make anything as beautiful. We can try, we can't make anything as beautiful as what he did. Uh, but that that's what I have to look at is what, what do I have to change, if anything at all? If we're lucky, we don't have to change anything. Uh, but we would run in, into instances like that where we'd have to change some things. But that that's you get through that engineering stage, and then we go to CAD drawings, uh, where you just take those photos into the computer, take your measurements, and just recreate the whole thing, every single part in CAD. Uh, send those over over to the factory. You know, in some cases, we'd have to design the tooling. You know, like uh, I have show and tell props, uh, like. You guys, I'm sure, recognize oh, yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we we know what the outside shape is, but how do I put that together? I don't want a solid chunk of metal that weighs two pounds on that handle. So, you know, we make it hollow. I have to design how what's that inside going to look like? How's it going to lock together? That kind of thing. So right. that's kind of what my, my engineering end of it is, is I have to figure out how to put this in, how, how, to, how to put it together, the tang shape, how I'm going to anchor the tang and lock it all together where you put the pommel on it. It's just all that engineering end of it. So we, uh, so we get to the tooling stage, you know, our, our steel dies are made, our, uh, big blanking dies that will blank these tools that blank the, uh, the blade blanks out basically just a big sheet of metal just pops it out like a cookie cutter. You know, those get taken and put in the grinder, but you have to make a tool to actually pound that thing out. Mm -hmm. um, but you go through all that and then you get sample parts made and start putting them together. And then, you know, then it goes to the prototype stage. And this is before we do any plating or anything. We'll uh, look at any fit issues where things don't go together quite right. And you tweak the tooling a little bit. So, th so we're, we're like, uh, six to seven months in down the line now from starting. And then you'll start testing uh, different plating finishes get to get the final finish on the surface of the parts and go through another round of prototype stages. So we're, we're usually like, uh, uh, back then we were probably four to five prototypes, depending on the complexity, maybe four to five prototypes before you've signed off on one. And then went into production, you know, and then there's, then there's the other end of it where I have to design the, the displays and, you know, how, how they're going to be wall mounted. Um, you know, anything else, anything else weird about the product that we have to overcome. Like some, sometimes we'll come up with an idea on how we're going to, going to do something like the, uh, the decal on Sting's hand, handle, the silver vine. You know, we we tried a few things and they just didn't work. So we ended up going with a a water transfer, mm -hmm. just, just just a water transfer decal like you would use in a you know a model kit. Mm -hmm. Build model kits anymore? Probably younger yeah. crowd have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I used to <laughs> many years ago. I, I know what you're you guys know about. what I'm talking. About. Yeah, mm. um, that, but that's you know. So there's little things like that. Like you, you will come up with a process we think will work and it doesn't work, and you got to come up with something else. Uh, for the most part things went fairly smooth like that, but that that's pretty much the development process. The, uh, the, the way we do it now, everything is built in, in 3d CAD, you know, we're doing everything in the computer. When, mm -hmm. when I first started the first year, so this would have been 2001, I guess by, mid 2002 we had just started that process of mm -hmm. doing 3d cad and being able to 3d print a part 
you know, now that's common. Everybody does it. You can buy a 3D printer yourself and do it. But back then, you know, that was really rare. Mm. And we had a, you couldn't just go buy a printer. We could find a company to print it, to print it for us. But we weren't even doing 3D CAD up until that point. So those first three or four Lord of the Rings swords, um, I'll show you what we were doing. Back then, if you wanted to make tooling for a handle, we would do a carving. Oh yeah, and, very cool. And it would it would be a two time depending on the level of detail, it would be a two X scale or four X scale. But all those parts that were going to be cast in metal would start with a wood carving. This mm -hmm. is a uh uh, I don't know if you guys remember the Indiana Jones Bowie. Uh, that I did this back in um, whenever the last whenever uh, the last Crusade came out, whatever year that was. That's when I did this. But this is the only one of those I have that survived the process. But we would do a big wood carving, um, and then a panograph machine would, you know, it's basically just a little needle would go back and forth, and just kind of scan this whole thing and then another machine is taking that path from the needle and cutting it into a copper electrode at one times at the at actual mm -hmm. size and in the process these will get destroyed because as that needle goes over this wood is being shredded uh, but that's how we did it back then that's how we started that and mm -hmm. i wish i had some of those carvings i wish some of those still survived because uh they're really awesome looking i mean some of the detail we had in those things was incredible Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, around uh, mid-2001, that's when it all went computerized and we were doing, I think the first one we did in 3D CAD was probably the uh, Enduro Scabbard. It's probably those cast metal parts because I remember getting a 3D print of that and putting everything together and nothing fit. You know, you had to go in and sand the pieces uh, Nothing was ever the tolerance right. So you had to make things fit by sanding parts down and modifying it. But um, that slowly progressed to where everything is 3D CAD now. So I don't even do anything hands-on anymore. It's all done in the computer. Somebody over on the other side of the world is making the tooling and shooting the parts out. And I just get them back here basically finished. And the only work I do is if things don't fit, then I'll disassemble something and regrind it or take a Dremel tool it, to it and make it work. But that's, that's basically the process that we're doing now. Hmm. Uh, but I, I kind of miss cool. the hands-on on work that I used to do, but it's definitely a lot easier now. Because hmm. I cool. can just sit at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Now, um, there's some discerning collectors out there, and I'm guilty of that. I'm a nitpicker of art. Yeah. You're discerning? <laughs> <laughs> I think, but uh, you know, sometimes we we gripe about there being minor differences or things that we can see between what was on the, in the movie, for example, and then the replicas that we purchased from United. Now, what can you tell us about the challenges that and the the decisions that go into the process? Like, where do you have to figure out where the compromises have to be made to create certain replicas. I know you just mentioned like, okay, it looks a certain way, but we can't make it like that. Like you couldn't have that two pound chunk of aerograms hilt. And so you have to figure out the inside, but externally, I mean, it still looks like what we saw in the movie, barring yeah, a couple that, of that, touches. That was a rather, here here. Yeah, yeah, that was a simple one, but there, I mean, there's lots of them that we had, you know, there's only so much we can do in machine grinders and, uh, you know, Peter Lyon can do whatever he wants. Well, he can't do whatever he wants. I'm sure he would, he would say otherwise. He would say, well, I can't, you know, he, he has his limitations with the equipment he has, but he can do a lot more than what we can do on a machine grinder. So, you know, he probably, probably the most, uh, visible difference you can see on almost every blade is the depth of the hollow grinds and the fullers in what Peter made versus what United made. He right. can get a much smaller radius on those linishers and get those, I mean, those really beautiful curves and those blades and they just reflect the light beautifully. You know, we're half that, less than half that on the, on the radius. We're, 
we're we're stuck to grinding wheels and these machine grinders that you know the smallest wheel we can get is about that big you know peter can mm -hmm. do down to this size if he wants uh so that that's one visual difference and that unless you had the real sword and our side by side that's probably not something most people would notice but you do notice it when you get to the ends of the hollow grinds you know where those grinds in just before the hand guard and a lot of those especially the elvish swords the uh, those grinds kind of taper off and if you look at some of peter's swords that radius gets a little sometimes they get bigger but sometimes they get smaller as it tapers off and we just miss mm -hmm. a lot of that look in our replicas because we just can't do it. Um, I probably got up. Let me grab something here. These are going to be part of the show and tell later, but one of these has really deep. I don't, can you even see that? Yeah. 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 One of this is the United replica. Yeah. This is uh, a prototype of the museum replica, and we do have those deeper grinds, but you can, I think you can see the difference. It's like night and day. Yeah. When you yeah. Have outside. Yeah. Easily. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that's the mm -hmm. main thing that we had that, you know, that, that, that's just something we didn't have a choice in. Obviously, with with being able to produce the museum version, it's fair to say that you you United could technically, with the investment, produce swords that are closer looking to the ones in the movie. But uh, I think, but maybe a fact, lot of folks don't yeah, understand not, that not the plan about product. that is is that you, yeah. you wouldn't be able to bring that to us in a way yeah. that's affordable for the average collector. Is well, right? it's correct, but we we can't really do that on a mass production like um, right. I don't know how many Andurals have been made, but you know, there, there's probably over a thousand of those are made every year. Um, you know, we can do 600 of them and get the grinds to look good. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but if you go way back when we started this, we couldn't, we couldn't do that museum collection Anduro. We didn't have the types of grinders to even do that back then. Right. Um, so we're, we're getting closer to being able to do some of the things we, we couldn't do in the past, but then on the other hand, there's things that are happening, things we could do in the past, we can't now. Hmm. Um, so the, it kind of goes both ways depending on the product. Like, let me grab another example here. This is one I'm sure anyone who's bought one of these recently and compared it to an older one, this is the prop. Hmm. You see those grinds. Those circ I don't can you see that in the yeah yeah circular yeah. grind okay well that's something that's impossible to do in a hollow grinder um you know they're they're just a wheel you can taper off but you can't curve back on itself so we had to my my initial thought was or not my initial thought the factory just wanted to round it off don't even try to come back on that radius and I thought, well, let's, I'm always for pushing the envelope. And that's something that I, I did for years when we would do the, the Gil Hibben fantasy knives, you know, they're the factory initially is going to say, oh, we can't do it. We can't do this. We can't do that. And I'm like, well, what if we did this? And you just, you just have to push them to try something or try to get a new machine that they don't have to do what you can't do at the moment. So we did talk to the factory doing the Arwen sword about well what if you got a uh, a grinder like picture uh, like a dremel tool with a disc on it what if you hit yeah. that with a disc make make a custom disc grinding wheel grinding disc that's the size of the radius you need and just go into that mm -hmm. uh with a with a cnc router and just punch that in there and get that radius and then just go over it with a satin finish and try to blend it in and they did that and they pulled it off and so the those first few years uh they, that looked pretty good then the machine started to wear and it ended up looking bad where you could see the whole disc you weren't just seeing that that end radius mm -hmm. and it just it got worse and worse and eventually the uh the grinder they made 
uh, I don't think I don't think they made it. I think they bought something and modified it. But anyway, it broke, and it was going to be a hundred grand to build a new one, and they didn't want to do it. And anyway, so one thing led to another, and and then we uh, like that. That's the uh, production one. That's what we pulled off, but you can, this is one of the later ones. And I don't know if you can even see that, but the finish doesn't match from here to here. Right. And that just, yeah. Yeah. There's a so, line. So, yeah. So what happened is we abandoned that. And now the, now those grinds just kind of taper off. They don't even reverse the curve like that anymore. So there's, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's situations like that where now we can't do what we used to be able to do, <laughs> but that. <laughs> So but that, that's a good works. example of trying to come up with a way to to do something that you know we didn't think we could do and anytime we could we would try to but there, there's always in situations where we just don't we're not capable with mass production machinery to do what what they did on the actual problem sometimes um, right. but I, th I think maybe 75 percent of the time we we pretty much nailed it at least for for a production replica, we pretty much nailed it. There's only a few instances where we had to change things that I can think of. Mm -hmm. I'll probably think of more while I'm sitting here, but um, there were, I'm trying to think what are some of the other compromises, like the braided leather grips on the Gimli axes. We had no way of doing braided leather on those axe handles. Mm -hmm. So that's just embossed into the leather. Um. The braided what leather on the Isildur sword. Right. You know, being a, um, that's a whole other issue because that that I wasn't as involved in that as I was in the previous Lord of the Rings replicas when that one was made. Uh, but obviously that one was wasn't a disaster, but it looked like a piece of plastic. Uh, <laughs> there, there's corners you have to cut like that that we weren't happy about it. But between not doing it and doing it with embossed with the braided look embossed in the leather, I'd take the embraided one, the embossed one over doing nothing. And those uh -huh. ended up being very successful. Now, I I don't recall hearing people complain about it. I complained because I wanted it deeper. I wanted the embossing deeper, but that was as, as good as we could get at the time. Um, hmm. There's some other ones like the, you remember the very first Gondor shield, the wood version? Yeah, that's what I have. Okay, that we had to find a factory that can make that. And it, I think the factory made barrels is what they actually did, mm -hmm. um, which are a very, very similar process when you think of how a wood shield is made to how a barrel is made. So, yeah. But they, they had some barrel making equipment and jig sized for a certain length. Well, our shield needed to be about eight inches. I, mean, I don't think it was that long, maybe six inches longer. Well, they couldn't make it any longer. So we shortened the shield. Um, prop has a, the tree on the prop is not a silk screen. It's a big piece of metal, you know, that's really finely detailed with holes punched through and etching in the surface. And we we could blank steel out, but we couldn't do anything that fine. And we're, our, we could deep etch steel, but we couldn't deep etch, I mean, that tree was this wide. We couldn't deep etch a piece of steel that wide. So we just compromised and just ditched the whole metal thing and silk screened it. You never see it in the film clothes. I mean, people have seen my prop now and they know that's not a silk screen, but you know, that's mm -hmm. a compromise. Like I didn't, I never liked that shield. Everybody loved it at the time, but I didn't like <laughs> it. I knew what it was supposed to look like. And it just killed me that we couldn't do anything even close to it. Plus there's a beautiful handle on the back that was leather wrapped and engraved steel. We couldn't do any of that on that, that shield replica, but um but collectors liked it, so I guess I guess it came out okay in the end. Yeah. Um, and the, there's well, there's other instances like like the uh, first product we did was Sting. We didn't have a prop when we first started. We we talked to them about getting props, but none of that had been worked out yet. And we were going to try to get that on the market for the December release, which meant we had to start. We could not wait three or four months for them to make us a prop and send it. We had to start ASAP as soon as the license was signed. So what I had were prop master photos. And ideally you want 
you know, if you if you've got a a product, you want a nice clean profile photo. You know, so I I know exactly what that shape is. You shoot the photo at this angle, that's giving me a skinny shape. And I I don't really know if that's going to look right when it's replicated. That's what the sting photos looked like. You know, they're some of the photos are like this, some of them are like this. I never had a good profile. Hmm. So I had to, uh, but I, I was used to that because that's usually how I would get uh, my reference from uh, for other film licenses. It's terrible photography. That's usually what I had to work with. You just have to work around and extrapolate from angles what the true profile is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And Sting came out looking good, but the shape was not correct to the prop. It's much slim. The blade is much slimmer. The guard is probably uh, three eighths of an inch shorter. Um, everything's just slightly out of proportion. Still look great, mm -hmm. but you know that that's an that's an example where had I had the prop, we could have nailed it, and we are going to nail it. We're doing a new version of it right now. But, you know, that thing's been on the market for 20 years. I don't think anybody complained about it until I started <laughs> out that it's not right. Because, yeah, 99% <laughs> of people don't know. No. Yeah, well, they, they did when we did the the museum uh, yeah. version because that was proportioned correctly. Um, so, you know, it was pretty noticeable if you own the original Sting that the VMC version was different. You know, but that's yeah. just that's just how, how it worked out. You know, we eventually did get a knife. I think they loaned us a prop. Uh, the I ended up getting a a uh, the smaller scale one, but I think they loaned us the full size one, the one that Elijah used. You know, but we'd already done the tooling; it was too late at that point. But we got all the reference from that that we needed. Um, that I'm using now. You know, twenty right. three later, twenty four, twenty five oh, years. Yeah. Later. Um, yeah. Was was there a, a directive from New Line that you make? like say sting which was the only hobbit weapon at the time and has been for a long time until sam's finally came along that that, that it be middle earth size or was that united's decision they, your decision they uh i don't i don't recall them ever talking to us about that um i remember having conversations with the the folks at united um about what you know, i had to explain what why there's two scales because you know, you're dealing with people who hadn't read the book. They don't understand that they're using uh, film trickery to make these little people look to scale with the adults. So you have to yeah. have two scales. And I said, so in the film, you know, your sting is going to be this long. To a human, that's a, that's a film scale sting. So I'm, I'm trying to explain to them, you know, but when you see the scenes of Elijah holding it, it's going to look like a big sword because you're not seeing, unless you see him in frame with a human, you're not going to know how, what the size of that is. Mm -hmm. So we had to decide, are we going to do one scale or the other? I was always pushing for doing what you see in the film. I want it to be scaled accurate for the film. And unless there was some way to do something in between. And with that, we ended up finding out there's three different scales maybe more. I think there may have been another scale as well, but so what we ended up doing was, was a middle scale and no one knew it was any different because there were, there was never a replica at this size on the market. So when no one really knew people figured it out later when they started scaling the, the swords and, and uh, yeah. online, see, see people well, the, it's supposed to be this size, the noble collection version that came out. I think it was after United's, but they they made theirs actor scale. So a lot of people wondered, and they said, "Oh, United's got the wrong size," or people, "No, Noble's got the wrong size." Until somebody like, "No, they're actually both correct, and these are the reasons why." But you know, yeah, yeah, people understand that now. We actually bought mm -hmm. one of those when it came out because we wanted to see, you know, you know we didn't know are, are we doing the right thing? Should we have made it bigger? So we got one of theirs and then got ours, and we all agreed we like ours better. The other one just felt too big. Um, but do you think people would have liked it as much had we done the, the actual film scale that small? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I always think back on it. Should, should we go back and do on this scale? I don't think anybody would want it. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, that, that was just an internal conversation we had. I don't, I don't think they could have, and I may have just forgotten it, but I don't think new line really had any opinion on that at all. Yeah. The, the kind of directions we got from them are what we should be making, what, at least if from the beginning, what they thought we should be making versus what I thought we should be making. Cause that, that's another big conversation. What, what of all this stuff we're looking at, what are we going to make? Obviously right. you want Sting, Glamdring, Enduro. You I mean the, the main character weapons, but start with those three. Um, New Line wanted ring race swords. And I like the Witch King sword, um, you know, which we ended up modifying and making different from the prop. That's a whole other conversation, but they were really pushing us to do orc weapons because there's so many orc weapons and they had just pages and pages of photos of the orc weapons. And I just looked at that stuff and I thought, yeah, it's cool, but I could see the uruk sword for, for film two, but I really couldn't see doing any of the other stuff. Mm -hmm. We kept pushing back on that, but they were in the beginning, they were really pushing for that. They thought that was going to be something everybody would want it would want. You know, I thought the Sauron stuff, yeah, the ring race stuff, yeah, but just didn't see the orc weapons. But that that's kind of conversation that New Line had with us. Uh, I, but I personally think you made the right call, but uh, some folks out there love the orc stuff. But yeah, um, I, I well, like it. I just it's, I don't want it all yeah. on my wall over the other yeah. stuff. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, Joan cared of rusty stuff. Uh, so uh, on a similar note to this, the issue of the scale, uh, I don't think a lot of folks are aware that, that, you know, with these productions, there are several, there are multiple versions of any given prop that are created for shooting and uh, they can and often are different from each other. So if you're not given the actual prop to work with, or even if you are, and then you look at reference material and then you realize that, oh, you know, there's like five or six different ones that I can see. Now, how do you decide which one to use? Can can anyone replica ever said to be truly accurate? Maybe other than maybe the hero prop itself? Or I, I always go by what do you see in the film? And if you never see the, that particular prop up close to say this is the definitive one, if you, that never happened in the film, then you just kind of pick whatever whatever looks best this is kind of what we would go to next. But if you saw it in the film, I was always trying to go for whatever we saw in the film. Uh, one example of that is uh, King Theoden's sword, uh, the one I just had the, the guard for. The prop we were sent is different than the one they used in the film. And I think what happened, everything's the same except the pommel. Um, the pommel on the Thaden sword has these two little cuts instead of a hard straight pommel like a uh, like a Roman gladius has. Mm -hmm. That's how the prop was. And it's a really short handle and is they got on set and the actor decided this hurts. It did hurt. <laughs> to hold that thing and swing it, it really dug mm -hmm. into your that that's my guess is he thought he just didn't like the way it felt. So he had them go and modify it and they shaved it off. They actually replaced the whole pommel because the whole thing is different. That's not what our prop looked like. So, you know, but we didn't know that until we saw the two towers because all the prop reference I had looked just like the prop I was given. So, the, you know, that's an example where they made a change. So we, we had already finished the tooling. We were going to have that on the market when two towers came out. We'd already finished the tooling. Then we saw, I think I saw it in the trailer, if I'm not mistaken, is where I first noticed it was different. And then, so then I started inquiring with new lines, like did the prop change and got some updated photos and realized, oh, they changed it. So we had to scrap the tooling because the guard and the pommel were in the same mold. Mm. And that's, you know. I feel like you dodged the bullet there with the collectors. <laughs> yeah, but it's a $10,000 piece of tooling. We just said, can't fix it. You got to make a new one. Oops. So, yeah, that would have been back to that, that would have been a mess had the replica come out and then the photos come out. You know, I'm not sure in the film you can really tell unless you're really looking. You know, but the mm -hmm. prop photos that came out later obviously would have shown that we made it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but you know, so that that's one thing that happens. There's there were a few props like that. Um, sometimes the hero versions were slightly different than the stunt versions. Everything we got was a stunt prop. We had photos of the hero versions for the most part, so we could see what those differences were. Um, trying to think of some other ones. The High Elven Warhelm was another one. When we did that, the prop we were sent, I'm pretty sure it was a screen use prop because it was beat up and it still had some of the, you know, the actress wore kind of wigs with those extensions for, for the elven hair. Some of that was still stuck in the in the prop that I got. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty beat up and the, one of the tips, was, I think the tip of the, the horn was broken off the top. So I thought, okay, well, this, this must be screen accurate. You know, and they, but then you go back and, you know, at the time, I think I'd just gotten the DVD of Fellowship. So I'm looking at the prologue, you know, and the resolution's not great on those DVDs, but I can see that the the helms later on in the, in the close-up, just before Sauron implodes, had gold vines on them. And the paint job was different than the prop I had. So then you go back and look at the earlier scenes when you see Elrond and the, the rows of elven soldiers... They don't have gold vines on them, hmm. you know. And it, when it, when I started digging into it, then I go look at the prop photos and all the reference we had, and you find out there's about three. I think I think I counted four different paint jobs on those helmets, and I think those pickup shots where they painted the gold vine that was the best looking one. So that, you know, the decision was: do you do the gold vine or not? You know, there were no other replicas on the market at the time. We didn't have the little Weta miniatures yet. That had the gold, right? They, they they went with that gold vine and everything later, but we hadn't seen any of that yet. So I, we just thought, well, what do we like better? We like the one with the gold, and it gets a close up. There's one good close up in the movie, so that's what we did. And you know, now obviously we're we're doing a new version of that. We're trying to get it even closer, but that was one example. Um, the gold doves on Faramir's sword. There isn't a single prop. I've got pictures of four different props. The doves are different on every one. So and they're not really, I don't think that was ever intended to be seen up close. So there's not really a final design and none of the designs really look clean or good. Um, not That's no slide against Weta. They, were, they had so many props they were going to make. You know, not every one of them was going to be a hero prop that could survive a close-up. And I think that's one they... I think even Peter said that in one of the the videos that I've seen, uh, how he was disappointed because he didn't do as much work on the blade as he would have liked to. And then Peter ends up having this big close up in the film where you can see the whole blade. Um, <laughs> you, you just don't know when they get on screen what they probably told him. This is just going to be a background thing. You're not going to see a close up. Right. So that's why they never did it. But, you know, we're doing the replica. What do I do? Which Are we going to pick one of those or do I have to kind of merge them? So I just merged them and did a clean version. That's what's on the replica. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's there's instances like that where you just have to make a call. What is the final version? That's kind of what I did. It's not film accurate, but mm-hmm. nobody knows what film accurate is on that one. Right. I know as a collector... And as someone who's grown up with the films, I know I appreciate the philosophy you guys have of trying to stick as close to what you see on screen, because that's what I'm familiar with as a collector and a fan. And so that's what I want my collectible to look like as close as possible. You know, and so I appreciate that, that philosophy you guys have. Um, So um, what was the hardest prop from Lord of the Rings to replicate and why what made it difficult? Do you, can you remember? Oh, they they were all easy. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly all of them had there was some type of challenge. Um, I suppose the hardest one, just in terms of trying to come up with how how we're going to do it, number one, and all the time spent on ways to do it that didn't work it's probably the high elven war sword mm. um because and and this is where you know Weta can do this beautiful sword but there is no real sword of that it's a sculpture cast in urethane and painted 
it's a real blade, but they never had to make that handle. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so we're trying to figure out what, how, how do we do a real world version of this? It's a leather wrap with a vine wrapping around it that blends perfectly in with the guard and the pommel. You know, they're all one piece. So, you know, I'm, th- I'm thinking what we're going to have to make a uh, solid part for the two end caps leather wrap the middle and come up with some kind of flexible gold band. And then what do you, what do you cast that in? Do you make it in pieces that half wrap and just stick it all together? So we tried all kinds of crazy things and none of it worked. It all looked like garbage. And in the end, I just thought, what if we just do it in two halves? You're going to have a seam, you know, but there's really no other way to do it. Do it in two halves, do it in metal where I can get the, the, the brass, metal to look like metal powder coat the leather part we just mold texture it so it looks like leather and so that that was that's one that was probably the biggest compromise we had to make to try to create a replica that looked like it did in the film but it's still there's a big ugly seam on it on the top and the bottom yeah. um, so we had to come up with a uh, i think we used uh it was basically bondo it's the same type of uh of a filler that you would use to fill cracks or, or dents in a car. That's what was used to fill the gap, sand it over and paint it. And it ended up, I don't know what the current production looks like, but the original run came out looking pretty good. I thought uh, but that, that that's one that was probably the hardest because I know we blew, we probably blew a year on that, just trying different things and nothing worked. And I would, I, would not give up on that because I wanted that. Mm. Um, but so that that was a compromise we had to make. And Matt, what what did you guys think of that? Um, I mean, when I when I first got it, I, I remember pulling it out, out of the box and and looking at the handle and I'm and being just feeling that disappointment because I wanted that leather wrapped handle with with the wrap around vine and metal, like you said, because it's such a like I personally I love the Elven weapons more than all the rest as far as the different cultures of, of middle earth yeah, same um, here. i'd already had had a fang and i loved it and uh when when i pulled that out and realized that i i think part of me instantly understood that this would have been too difficult or would have made it too costly or whichever uh but uh yeah and it i mean obviously it, it lends a greater amount of weight to the weapon as well um which let's let's be realistic we know these aren't functional so that's they're always you know two three four pounds heavier than their real world counterparts would have been but yeah I, I did experience that disappointment that it wasn't what I envisioned I knew this isn't what it was supposed to be but accepting that this was the best that we would ever get and then I was just grateful that this replica gorgeous as it is I'd just been made at all I, I got over it pretty quick one thing I I, I do recall though is that uh, you came up with a really amazing design for a floor stand for that weapon yeah. that United, I guess they turned it down and they went with the wall display. And I eventually did have uh, our amazing uh, Andrew uh, into darkness. Yeah, he saw the photo sure. of, of the one you posted online that you still have. And uh, he made uh, he made one for himself and one for me. So that's um, actually my original prototype. I don't remember yeah. why I'm assuming why did they that nixed that. Saw- I, I think it was probably for cost, yeah. um, but honestly, I don't remember why they nixed it. They liked it. It wasn't because they didn't like it. I hate the wall display. Um, that's not my design. Uh, what they I call it the bat symbol. <laughs> I I don't even remember who it was. One of my I had a crew of about eight people, and I think I was in. I'm sure I was in Taiwan or China at doing a factory visit. But that's when I'm out of the country, work doesn't stop. My staff is still doing stuff. So I think that was done when I was out of the country. And when I got back, I was so worn out on that project that I was like, yeah, fine, whatever. You know, and then then when it when it comes in, I look at it like, I don't really like that at all. I I should have just taken 30 minutes, sketched some things up and given it to one of my guys and said, let's try something more like this, because it just. It's not terrible. Just I, I nitpick everything that I didn't do 
I need to pick my own stuff too, but if I didn't do it, I always see flaws in it. Uh, but I, I really don't remember why they, I, I, it had to have been cost for that floor display. Cause it was a big, it was a bunch of pieces of wood and would have taken up more, would have probably cost three times what the wall plaque cost, taking up more room in the packaging. Uh, but yeah, that was a shame. We didn't get to do that. I, but, uh, I don't own it, the, the high Alvin it's, it's on the, the list, but I have seen it in person and I've, and I had no idea that it was a two piece, like, you know, just when you look at it, I thought for the longest time it was leather, you know, and, and so it fooled me. And I mean, that's, that's all I think you can really ask for in a wall yeah, mounted. If, if it fools you, we, then we did okay. Yeah, but but it, was, it was disappointing that we couldn't do it the way we wanted, but. Uh, but I, I still think it's it's a great replica though, and it looks quite good. Oh, too. for sure. I, I've always wanted you guys to do the scabbard. <laughs> I don't know if that's ever going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's another one where, you know, you've got this beautiful scabbard that is essentially a sculpture. You know, there's no real scabbard. It was a sculpture, cast in your cast in urethane and painted, and you've got all those you know beautiful vines. I love it when they would design. I mean. I'm being sarcastic. I love the designs, but I mean, it, when I say I love it, I hate it when they do a design where you've got some flowing metal piece that blends into another metal piece that is impossible to cast as one piece. And so that scabbard, our, the R1 sword scabbard was a similar type of issue, but yeah, I really may happen one day. You never know. I came up with a way to do both of those. It was just so expensive. The tooling was so expensive that they got nixed immediately. We didn't even get to the to the uh, CAD drawing stage. You know, just kind of ballpark a price and tell them this is what this tooling's going to cost. Yeah, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. So those didn't happen. But sure. um, but but as far as most complicated or hardest, that was probably probably it. The uh, steel homes were a nightmare. Just trying to get those right or anything close to accurate on those. Mm -hmm. um, but that. Yeah, that had a fang or that uh, high elven sword was not a fun project. <laughs> no, the reverse of that, and not necessarily because it was easy, but what was your favorite prop replica that you worked on? Like, what was the one you were just dying to get your hands on that New Line says, okay, go ahead and make this one? And you're like, yes, finally. Well, New Line didn't tell us, I told them, and Dural. <laughs> <But>, okay. <laughs> um, they they knew the story they knew this order was go was going to be reforged you know we had three versions we had uh the original one for the prologue you had the shards that you see and then you had the reforged version and i'm telling them in the meeting this is in the original uh meeting in new york when we were before we had the license and i'm looking at the photos and i'm i'm sure the people at new line knew the story they probably just I mean, they're they're dealing with all kinds of licenses, not just Lord of the Rings. But I'm telling them what's what this is, who this character is, flipping through their books of the photos. And I said, oh, here's the shards. Here's here's Narsil. Here's Andural. Um, we'll we'll do all of these. We'll do all three of these. And they're you know, the guys from United who are with me are like, we're not doing a broken sword. I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> when to want this? So I. They just wanted to do the the reforged version. They didn't see any point doing Narsil. And I thought, no, if this does well and the movie's good, people are going to want all three of these. Mm -hmm. So we started with Narsil. Um, I can't remember if we did the, did we do the shards before Enduril? I think uh, we made that. Yes. Yeah. Because the uh, shards had the, yeah, the was, red box and the first Enduril had the blue box. So yeah. That's how I remember. It, oh, I, yeah, I've got it right here beside me. Uh, the box is sitting right here because um, we're looking at doing another version of that at some point. Uh, but we, um, so we did we did Narsal, and I thought we'll sell five hundred of those. You know, we sold like two thousand the first year. I thought, oh okay. Um, is anybody going to want Enduro when it comes out? Because they already own this sword now. You know, now I'm thinking, did, or, did we oversaturate? <laughs> So we did. So we did the uh, the shards on the plaque, which everybody hated, but I couldn't come up with another way to do it at the time. Um, 
and that was a limited edition. And, you know, in my mind, I think, yeah, I'm right. I know this is going to sell, but then when it actually comes in and you're like, is it going to sell, you know, because I've been wrong before and they sold out like that, you know, all the dealers just bought them up the week they went on sale for pre-orders. They're gone. So the, at that point I knew, okay, Enduro's fine. We're fine. But that was my favorite just to get, get to that final version with the etching on it. And, and I knew we were going to do the scabbard at that point, but that, that's really just because I love that sword. That's my favorite design that Weta did that, that the crew did there. There, I love them all, but I love that the most. Me too. It's <laughs> a great sword. Yeah. So is there something that hasn't been replicated yet that you're really hoping to do? You know, of all, there's so many wonderful designs from those films, and not all of them have been replicated yet. Is there some that you're really hoping you get the green light on in the future here? Yeah, all of them, really. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we've had a list of kind of a priority list. These are the main items we'd still like to make. Here's some secondary, some tertiary stuff. Um, you know, that's been floating around since uh, I think the last time we we made the I think when I made the current list when it started was 2007. And you know, the whole thing had slowed down around that time. So we're, we're rolling around 2010 or so. You know, we're th at that point, it was just, it's a maintenance level license, meaning you're, we, we're still selling stings. We're still selling glam dreams because there are still new people, new watchers to the films and new fans every year. So, and they were, you know, so you get new collectors, they're going to want those products. They stayed on the market. That's how I knew the fan base never went away. It just kept slowly growing is that those Sting, Glamdring, and Enduro never stopped selling. So when the new owners of United bought the company, obviously we had the discussion of what can we do? We still wanted to do every couple of years, put something new out, even though the sales were pretty much just at maintenance level at that point. But then something happened around 2010 the interest started to come back up. And it was because of the buzz about the Hobbit films. So by the time 2013 rolls around, you know, it's a full license again. And we had like probably a dozen of the replicas back on the market again. So now we're back into reissuing things that had been discontinued. Uh, but at that time we started a, we, 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 I was maintaining a list and it, you had dealers asking you for something because the collectors were asking for something we had people on, you know, you see people on the forum saying they want this or this. So you just add that to the list. And so we have this master list that has literally everything we could possibly do. And what we haven't done, a lot of things that we never got to make the first time around, we've since made. Um, like the Sauron Mace, you know, that was in the original run um, and it got canceled. Uh, but Legolas, the Lothorian bow, obviously, that's top of my list. And I think everybody else's list, it's always been in the top of whenever uh, United, whenever Drew has done a poll, that's always up there in top two or three. I think it was number one in the last one. Mm. Uh, Sword of Haldir is always up there at the top. Uh, Gimli's throwing axes are always on there. I think the third one is always... Um, Marion Pippin's uh, Noldoran knife. Mm -hmm. um, so the those are those are going to happen at some point. I mean, there are two of those are already in in progress. Um, a few other ones that I really want to get made: Gilgalad's shield. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. Um, Sword of Denethor, which I'm I think you guys really want to see. Or at least valid didn't isn't that one that's on your wish list? Um, not so much actually. Um, um, I mean, I, even you said a couple of times that would be a challenge because the the prop is so rough. It's one of those where you're gonna have to interpret some yeah. things. I think you said, yeah, 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 um, definitely. Yeah, but yeah, no top top ones for me would be um, 
the remainder of the uh, well, what I like to call the barrel blades, but that's unfortunately not how how they came to be in the movies. But that's a whole other discussion. But whenever uh, whenever United has done polling on that, those yeah. always seem to be down at the bottom. I'd love to see those made too, but if the collector base doesn't really get off the right. bricks in this form i'm not sure it's it's going to happen i, I just i just lament that mary and pippin still don't have any weapons whatsoever on anyone's wall so that would be one way but the other way of course is the old and daggers and uh, it seems like there's a better hope for those yeah uh, well, one another one i'd like to see is that that third nazgul sword the one with the uh, yes the ring the on the, on the and that always yeah. falls at the bottom of the the collector polling too that's one i'd like mm -hmm. to see you're I'd asking the wrong people <laughs> <laughs> I'm always um, looking for that one. I like that one. You know, somehow the Sauron sword always floats to the top, and that's the one I really dislike. But <laughs> I can't that one, about, that's that's one that was fully drawn up, quoted, was going to be made, and then the uh, that's when the whole the market started to slow down after Return of the King, and it just got put on indefinite hold and then canceled. Um, but it's back on the list again now. Because that was always high on the list on the uh, on the collector polls. That going back to uh, 2015, it's always up there on the list, and it was like fourth or fifth on the last one. No, but I still think once that gets costed out, it's still like 50 50 if it actually happens. But I like yeah. the sword. I mean, I, I get why you why you would rather see something else instead of that. Uh, but that's yeah. one I'd like to see get made. One I'd really like to see get made. I, that I really wanted to do is is deathless. Um, I know there is a replica already out there, but I want to make it look. I, I always wanted to make that look right, like the prop did, because I really like that prop. Uh, but there's just no demand for anything from the Hobbit from the collectors that I've seen. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I could go on and on about stuff, but the ones I just mentioned, those are those yeah. are at the top of the list, and they're. They're really on the list to develop. It's just when we're going to be able to plug it in and get it done. Uh, the it bow is in progress right now. Awesome. Uh, the Aldir sword. I think I did everything on my end. Um, it just it doesn't have the green light yet. So uh, I think I did a little little work on the the Marion Pippin dagger. Done a little work on the Gilgalad shield. Uh, but you know, there's a there's only so much I can do or the factory can do. And we already have them working on, you know, when they're working on three or four things right now, you got to wait until they're done with one of those before you plug them into the, to the next one on the list. So yeah. there's only so many we can do at one time. And that's kind of where we are right now is that those are just, they're waiting, they're in the queue. They just haven't got to go yet. Right. Of course. You well, mentioned, uh, just quick here, you mentioned Denethor's yeah. sword. Um, and maybe I'm in the minority here, but I would love to see just the the Gondorian infantry sword. I think it's got a very cool pommel. You know, the Minas Tirith as the pommel. Uh, yeah. It's a pretty plain sword, and it's I don't even think it has a fuller. Um, it doesn't. And the Rohan Royal Guard sword. I, I, those aren't named characters per se, though, but they are very cool looking um, swords. And if that Rohan axe gets made, that maybe gives me hope that and if it sells well, then maybe there's a demand for some of the lesser known character, nameless characters, weapons. I think the, Ro the Rohan sword would probably get made before the that Gondorian sword does. Uh, but, and they're on the list. Both of them are. Cool. Uh, but, but it's swords. There's a lot of tooling and time and dollars invested in inventory whenever we do a sword. So. Mm -hmm. So there'll be one of those at a time, and right now that the Haldir one, I think, is the probably the the next one that will go into the tooling stage, mm -hmm. uh, and then probably one of Gimli's uh, throwing axes. I don't know if I mentioned that a minute ago, but that's another one high on the list. Is those two two throwing axes, and I don't think we'll do both of them at the same time. We'll probably start with one that does well, and then we'll do the other one. Right. Um. Now, it's possible that you may not be allowed to mention whatever this is if it does exist, but if you do, please do. But is there a replica that you actually got the green light on, got to work on, but then had to be canceled for whatever reason, and that you kind of regret that decision was made, and it's something that you hope you can still go back to one day? 
Uh, yeah, there were many of those and, and we ended up making some of those, but the ones that were started and canceled the Loth Lorgan bow, that was one. It's going to happen now. Um, Haldir was one that was started then canceled. The Sauron Sword was started then canceled. Uh, so those three definitely are, are at the top of the list. Um, Horn of Boromir was actually on the drawing boards at the oh, old yeah. unit and then canceled. And now we've done it. And then, mm -hmm. see, there's there's good, there's some benefit to, to that being canceled because we could do a better horn now than we could have done back then. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm happy that got canceled now because what we made probably looks 10 times nicer than what, what we were able to do back then. Right. Um, the polyresin factory that we we have now we were using another factory in uh, in China when we did those first poly products. Like the sculpting was great, production was not so great. Uh, just the like the paint job and decoration um, was nowhere nowhere near what we can do now. Well, I say that. I mean, you guys heard me talk about this. We can do you can do anything and get it to look good in the prototype, but then you have to get, get them to replicate that in production, which is not always the case. Um, as just happened recently with the uh, Elven Helm, uh, where they somehow they got shipped and skipped four or five of the paint operations and they weren't finished and someone moved them into the, the incorrect location in the factory, got boxed up and shipped to United. We get them, find out that they're unfinished, so they all had to go back. Um, you know, so that that's always a an issue. Is is I can approve something that looks perfect, but yeah, but like I said, the uh, the horn I think it's it's worked out good because we did a better horn than I think we would have been able to do back then, you know. And then there's the opposite of that, like the original Sauron helm, uh, the sculpting on that and the paint job, I think was much better than the second version United did. They could have done a better one, but it was there was uh, that was kind of rushed, I think, to get it to the market and. What I approved in the prototype stage did not make it to production, at least in the paint decoration, it didn't. So that's, but that's always a challenge is trying to get, trying to make sure what gets made is actually, is actually what I approved. Looks just like the prototype I approved. Interesting. No. Or I, I can think of too, the, uh, the crown of Gondor. Um, I mean, there's a noble version of that, but hmm. the yeah, the and, that, and that's why we canceled ours. Yeah, the UC one. I like the the pillow. It sits in there. The the display you guys have prototyped, and uh, the yeah, noble it, one is a little small. You know. Yeah, it would have it would have been small. awesome had we been able to finish it. Yeah, uh, but that that's another one. I don't know if United will go back to that one day. I don't think we've even discussed that in a few years. But yeah. had we made that back then. I don't think it would have looked any better than what Noble made. Um, possibly a little more accurate, accurate because I think we had better reference than what they had. I never had that prop, but I had some really good photo references. Um, we would have done like the the dimpled stipple effect on the on the, on the, on the feathers. Back. Yeah, I would have made sure we did on well both sides. It's supposed to be on the front too. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. But I, I would have made sure we had more of the the gaps in between the feathers instead of making one big solid thing. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I would do now. But back then, I don't know that we would have gotten it as detailed as what we could do now. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, we haven't even discussed doing that, but you know, that's, that's one that's possibility down the road. If we do everything else and, and the collectors are still, still there. Yeah. I'd mm -hmm. love to make that. Man. I love yeah, that. This, yeah, that'd be cool. I've, so I've got a, I have a box of a bunch of broken parts. Uh, rough yeah. cap when we tested that thing. <laughs> so you're also a collector, and as I'm sure people watching can see behind you uh, parts of your collection. Uh, do you remember your first collectible? This is kind of a question we ask everybody who comes on the show. Do you remember your first piece that you you purchased for your collection? Uh, when when I first started collecting i mean i was collecting toys 
right um, not to play with um star wars toys were the first collectibles that i i started getting and i th think the first collectible what i would call a collectible that i bought like i played with star wars toys as a kid but i mean the first one i bought that i just wanted this was probably in the x-wing and oh, yeah. and then <laughs> uh that kind of second wave of star wars toys that came it really kind of exploded when the the prequels came out and then we started getting when you know like we had a there was a beautiful tauntaun with han solo toy 12 inch hand so long it was about this big I, I would i had tons of that stuff it's all boxed up now but that that's really the first collectibles but the the first really cool collectible was probably the uh alien from ridley scott's alien film the the original yeah. alien big toy that was this big and i don't, have no idea what happened to it now i don't have it anymore but that was the first one that i remember vividly having thinking that because I because I didn't get it when it came out, I got it at a toy show. Um, you know, and trying to find one that still had the dome, the clear dome on it. I don't know if you guys are fans of the Alien films, but mm -hmm. I'm yeah, a fan of big fan. Those first two films, well, and even the third one, but um, trying to find one of those toys intact with the dome on it that wasn't broken, that hadn't been played with, and was missing an arm or something. And I found a pristine mint one, paid a good penny for it too uh but that that was the that was really the first one i think that got me kicked off but then i became a huge toy collector and then moved into swords and knives and all mm -hmm. the toys got boxed up so now nice. now it's just swords and knives and helmets that's what i collect now <laughs> very cool so out of the stuff that you do currently still have or know the whereabouts of what what's your favorite collectible and it doesn't have to be lord of the rings um, Probably the the two Lego bows and the quivers. Like if I had to get rid of everything, I'm keeping those. Mm -hmm. Those are the actual props, of course, right? Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know why I would keep those. I just love the way they look on the wall with with the quivers and the arrows in them, just as a a complete display. Uh, I just I just really like those. I like the I've seen the photo and it's amazing. Yeah, I like the Fellowship one best. Oh, like yeah. that better than the Merkwood bow. That's just me, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I I love those props. I don't think I would ever let them go. Um, you know, and I, I have other things like I have one of the Blade Runner, the Deckard pistol replicas. I just I have a little. I've stuck my hand in all kinds of different collect collectibles over the years, but currently most of it is in boxes because I have all these damn swords and knives and helmets taking up all the space that are everywhere <laughs> collector problems eh? yeah so some some who have been on uc forums know this and know but you have uh you have a significant <laughs> prop collection and we're not talking prop replicas but actual props and uh um you've uh kindly agreed to kind of show us some of these and uh would that be uh possible to get a look at some of these actual props from the films uh sure uh my well i'll turn the laptop around here in a minute but i have a few here well before we get into props i've got other things like this is the kind of stuff i do for my my day job not lord of the oh, rings yeah. but, um like the Honshu and the M48 lines for United, I do most of the design work for those two lines. You know, not not very oh, yeah. Lord of the Rings looking. These are more just functional, modernized versions of historical weapons. Yeah, that looked like a like almost like a sci-fi. It's funny you say that, but I, I could see Boromir's sword in the in the first one you held up, and I can see Sting in the shape of the lot, the second one you held up so maybe our brains are just too <laughs> that's actually the the pattern that the boromir sword is mm -hmm. a play um mm -hmm. not not the other way around i mean that's that style sword that's what boromir sword is mm -hmm. and this i think this is the second one i did for the i mean we did 
katanas and wakazashis but we did a, a broad sword but this is the second one we did and yeah I, I the reason i picked that as a second one is because i knew we're going to have the Hanchu collectors but we're also going to get lord of the rings collectors that love that pattern so mm -hmm. uh, it's done fairly well so far i mean they they've only been on the market for a short time uh but for for uh Lord of the Rings. I think I held this one up earlier, but that that's the small scale sting. And if you uh, look at it, you can tell proportionately it is not the same as the large one. And a lot of the the smaller ones were not exactly proportionate, but you would never notice that in the film because most of those were wide shots, you know, where uh, the small scale the the, the uh, small actor playing Frodo with his mask on is holding this but he's always in a wide shot you're never going to see that up close mm -hmm. uh, but that, you can kind of see uh how the vine is discolored over the years there's a the oh, vines yeah. are heavy lacquer and the lacquer is kind of yellowed over the years it used to be silver but that's it that's a stunt prop these are uh this is a cast urethane handle painted aluminum blade etched and that that's how all the props we were we were supplied were made like this. We didn't get any of the hero props. We we were loaned a few of the hero props in the beginning, but the props we actually got from Weta that they made for us uh, were were all like that. Like that. This is another one with a uh, for for those who want to know what the handle color is supposed to be. <laughs> that was a big controversy. <laughs> Yeah, it is. This is actually yellowed a bit more. It's a little bit darker amber. I don't know if you can tell the difference in the front and back, but it's gotten darker in some places. Uh, but that that's a an original Legolas prop. Um, that's one of my favorites. And you can see, yeah, this is. I don't know if you can even read that, but. Oh, they yeah, mark yeah. they for United, and I think it's 2000. Yeah, 2002 is when we had that made. Mm -hmm. And I had another one. I don't know where the other one is, but you it's remember. So well character. crafted. I mean, you holding them up to the screen. I mean, they look real. They look like real. Yeah, blades, and that, but... that's. Uh, we were talking about that earlier before you you came on and the podcast started is, is I I'd been in the movie replica industry since 1988. So, you know, about 10 years of seeing movie props and most of what I got was garbage. I mean, I, I would get badly made stunt props that were painted badly, which was fine for most films back then. But when we saw the wettest stuff, I mean, it was just, it blew us away how nice they were. And, and these aren't even hero props. This is a stunt prop. Yeah, hero props yeah. look nicer than this. But yeah, I, I was. They they weren't all beautiful and perfect, but um, I'd take that over the garbage I was sent. You know, like yeah, I'm not gonna not gonna slam any previous licenses, but <laughs> the garbage I got from some of these other licenses, this was a refreshing <laughs> change to it see. Makes you. Like actual craftsmen that knew what they were doing makes you think that uh peter jackson was ahead of his time and maybe predicting how good the resolution on our tvs would be nowadays with blu-ray and then 4k and now 8k and that you know you really the, the loveless scrutiny that we can now have by seeing this stuff close up on our screens is, is so much different like i almost feel like hollywood has to step up its game in the prop department to make stuff look I, good and I, I know a lot of it is cgi and guys computers can make anything look however they want but there's still a lot of practical effects that really can't get by the way that they used to would you agree yeah there there could have been there could have been some of that forethought by peter but i i think i think it was just, a lot of it was just hiring really good craftsmen for his crew and i also think that they were for where this was made, this wasn't Hollywood. And I think they were trying to just show, hey, we can do this and we can do it better. Mm. And and they proved that. Um, like I said, I've, I got a lot of Hollywood props and they were garbage. 
Uh, but they kind of, they kind of set a new standard. And I think they were trying to, they were probably trying to do that just to show we can do the best stuff in the industry right here. Mm. And mm -hmm. it, it, I, I think I've heard some of the, the, the various people at Weta say similar things to that, but, but I really, really do think that's true. I think they were trying to show, Hey, we can do this and we can do it better than what everybody else is doing. And they did. Uh, but that, that is another one that you might, might notice is a little different from what you're used to seeing. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were, I think three different colors of this. The, the dark Brown one is obviously the one that we see in the films. But the first props I was I was sent, that's that's it. And we almost went with that until I saw some of the photos from um, Two Towers. I think we started on this just before Two Towers came out. And then I saw photos from Two Towers, some of the on-set photos, and it was dark brown. So that's another one we had to make a change because we were going to go with that color. But that's another one we're working on a reissue of. Uh, but... Just to give people an idea, that is the same thing. This is a urethane prop replica. This is a stunt prop. And it that's how it comes out of the mold. And that's how it looks after Weta has done their paintwork on it. And they do some beautiful paintwork. I mean, uh -huh. this is one where if you see it on the table, you don't know that's not metal. Yeah, until you know. touch it. And the leather looks like leather because it's cast off of a real hero prop that was made out of leather. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So I've got sitting here. Um, this isn't a prop, but this kind of goes back to um, something we discussed on the forums. This is a... Uh, I think this is the first or the second prototype for the Gilgalad spear. And this is one we, you know, this is a compromise. We we could have done this in steel, but the compromise to do it in steel, this is all one piece on the prop. And it's just a sculpture that was painted in the film. There isn't a real one that was made out of steel. So they could kind of do whatever they want. But so you've got a blade it's going from here all the way to here. I mean, you can kind of see how big that is. We can't cast no. anything that big without having horrible deflection and warpage issues. And if I scale it down to where we can cast it, it's just ridiculously too small. So we looked at a couple of design options. Like one of the ideas was just to break it right there, do this as a cast piece, and just do this as a blade, and we'll etch all this in there. And I, I think I mocked several versions of that up and we all looked at it and just thought we're it's changing the design too much just doing poly resin make it look like it's supposed to so that's what we're doing but that that's a perfect example of some compromises that we have to to mm -hmm. work out make decisions on before we do a replica mm -hmm. okay and so it look, what i'm it looks do great <laughs> it looks okay that one needs some work it's we're actually going back and redoing the molds because there were some issues with uh, um, not necessarily the detail, but the angle of the blade on the prototype is just it, the blade drops down slightly too low, like about inch and a half from the from the shaft. So if you draw a line, straight line from the shaft, that point, the blade point drops down a little bit too low. Nobody's going to know this except for me because I own the prop and you own a prop that I know doesn't do that. Uh, not, not a prop, but you own a beautiful replica that doesn't yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. um, but they hadn't finalized anything. So I said, just go ahead and make a new master, make a new mold and let's fix it now. So that's what we're doing. That's why that one's not on the water right now and, and heading to the warehouse because I had to have them start over again. Um, but I think it was worth it. There's some other little tweaks we're going to do on it too. Um, I'm going to flip this around now. I'm going to take my my uh, handy generic Lord of the Rings helmet stand and prop this up a little bit. <laughs> Perfect. I can keep from unplugging everything. Okay, can we see this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, this is my my um, messy uh, guitar studio screening room. So there's crap everywhere. Uh, let me just get some junk out of the way. That's that's one of my new swords, not Lord of the Rings, but we were Lucky. talking about the uh, Swords of the Ancients line earlier. That's a new sword that's coming out this year. Mm -hmm. This is the. I can get back far enough to see the whole thing, uh, the Haldir sword. Oh yeah. Many yeah. folks have waited for that one. Yeah, I don't know if this is in focus or not, but give you an idea. Yep. What handle looks like this is another one I, d I don't know if you can tell on screen but you don't know that's real that's not real wood it looks just like it's real wood mm -hmm. until you pick it up and you can feel it i mean it's about the weight it's supposed to be but you can kind of feel it has a a plasticky feel but just looking at it i mean they did such a good job on this what that is is under this is a uh brush strokes and different different colors of brown to kind of get the wood grain. I don't know if you can see that, but mm -hmm. you look really close, you can tell it's it's been painted with a brush and there's really fine brush strokes. But from this distance, it looks like wood. And then they put the, uh, the gold vine decal on it. And then there's a really thick, probably a millimeter, 1.2 millimeter thick lacquer on it that they've polished. And it just ends up looking like a piece of real wood. And they've they've electroplated the the palm a little bit. This one's a little beat up, so it's scratched in places. Uh, the this is another one. I don't think that this was ever intended to be seen up close. You can kind of see it's a, it's a little rough in the grinding, and the deep etching. Mm -hmm. But that that is your. Your typical aluminum blade. This is another one where you've got that that cursed Arwen blade, Arwen sword blade grind. That oh, yeah. a little circle that we're going to have to modify a little bit. But so that's in the works right now. So if you have to put a, a percentage on it, how say how close would you say United's uh, version is going to be to that prop? Uh, the like overall. In terms probably, of getting the, the, the detailing on the blade. The, yeah, the handle, I think, is no problem. But this, this is a problem. Yeah. You, can, you can mill that and see and see it, but we can't really do that in production and get that. You know, doing a fuller groove that is straight or even with a slight curve on a milling machine, that's no problem. This stops before it hits the blade grind curves and tapers to a point i mean it's just something they're gonna they're gonna i know i'm gonna ask them to try it but i know it's not gonna work so what we're we're going to end up doing is probably stamping that whole thing at one depth to get the exact shape of the the groove that we want we'll we'll etch it in there just like this but this is probably going to end up being a stamp instead of a, a curved groove right. so that that one area that's going to be the big difference and that and that uh, radius grind right there, but everything else, none of this is really an issue. Doing these, that's just a standard hollow grind. That's a standard hollow grind on the top. Okay. Um, the the uh, one area that we will have to make a compromise is that's not going to be wood, and it, it's. I'm sure. You guys have some of the originals, so you have the old versions when United did wood handles, but it's getting harder right. and harder to get consistent wood, to get the shapes consistent. The R1 sword is one that's pretty much on the chopping block right now. That's going to be changed to an injection mold, and it'll be a, a water transfer type of decoration for the wood grain with a kind of a thick lacquer over top of it like this. But that that's the one area that I have to get worked out to make something that's going to look, I want it to look as real as this, obviously. Right. Uh, this is a plastic handle too, but I don't know if we can get it that nice, but that's, that's one of the hurdles that has to be worked out. Right. Well, that's too bad, but understandable. 
Yeah, it's just I I hate it, but that's just the way the whole market has moved. It's just it's almost impossible to get wood proper wood handles made anymore. Mm -hmm. and the like I said, the Arwen sword is one that they had continued to, and now it's there's issues with that. Um, so that that's the next one on the chopping block. I'm pretty sure I've shown that on the on the website, but that's the uh, Witch King dagger. Mm -hmm. You can see how finely oh, yeah. yeah all the weathering is on the on the blade and, on and that's the that's the lord of the rings version correct not the hobbit one correct the hobbit one was uh as far as the pattern was pretty much dead on but the uh corrosion was slightly different and i don't know if that was intended to be the exact same one i don't know why it wouldn't be um you know, that's a whole other discussion, how that could be the same one. Yeah. Um, but I, I I like this version better. And United did two of those. We did one that was just the plain one because we really didn't have the the uh, blade factory that did the first version, couldn't do the, the deep etching. And then we did a second version, I think, which is, I think the second version was in the Hobbit packaging. And yeah. All the etching on it. And I made custom etching parts, took photographs of all the the corrosion that you see here and made a cu custom pattern that they could etch to try to match this look as close as possible. And it, it got about 70% there. But that's always been one of my favorites. I think I've shown that one on the forum before too, but Strider yeah. sword or Strider's knife. It's an elven knife, which I've believe is being reissued it's probably going the the uh new one is probably going to be on the market in the, probably in the next month or so i think these are on the way now if they're not already shipping uh, but that that's one that we made those a short a small run of those at the original united and i don't think it's been on the market since like 2004 or 2005 so we, we finally decided it's it's expensive. This this is the one that comes with the scabbard, and that's expensive. Mm -hmm. That's my scabbard. It's just an unpainted urethane casting that I used to do the original. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always like that one too. But it, you can uh, that's another one that's marked when Weta made it for us. But you can kind of see how thick these blades are. Yeah. And the I don't wait a lot. <laughs> I don't know if the hero prop was made that thick, but the aluminum ones, I think they made a little thicker so that I could actually use them in stunt scenes without the blades bending. Uh, but yeah. that, that, well, we know that famously Vigo liked to carry the real weight yeah. of, of the weapons on him. So I'm <laughs> I bet his sure hero. On, yeah, there's a couple of times on screen when he has it out and it, it's not a stunt prop. He's got a real one. Yeah. Uh, but this is another one where they've, Hand painted the wood grain, and if you look close on that, you can tell that one's paint. But you know, from a distance, if you didn't have that in your hand, you wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, this one's that's a deep cut. That one, not many people are going to know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> I think I had, well, I had that. I had this one out earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Same type of prop. The. Uh, same type of finishing on the handle, the way that they did the wood grain and the decal. This this one's a little, this is a stunt prop and it's a little rougher. You can see the etching's a little rough. Yeah. I'm glad that you're showing that because some folks have affirmed that the Noble Collection version, for example, has the raised pattern on the hilt. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, I'm not sure what material it's made out of because I don't have it, but uh, it it's definitely seems separate from the handle and wrap around or added to it and I've, I've now i've gotten into some discussions to say that no i'm pretty sure that the actual you can see it in arwen's hands in the movie that it's it's exactly what you're holding but it's some people seem to prefer this you know sort of made up version that noble came up with because it looks fancier um i don't like it but i have this so i know what it's supposed to look like but i i don't like the exactly. one that uh you know, the master, the the Weta Master series version, you know, they had two versions. You had one where you had the, the raised vine on Sting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and he did and i think he was offering the movie version as well i just don't like the way that looks raised it's not terrible i just i want it to look like it looked in the movie i mean you can tell it's there's nothing raised it's under the lacquer on every one of these yeah. props it's under the lacquer yeah. yeah i think i much prefer that I suppose it could make the argument that something raised would provide the wielder a better grip but yeah uh, that's yeah and, and, they, and it may have been the intent to have them raised but they just couldn't do it for whatever reason mm -hmm. um, i seem to recall someone saying that it it actually was intended to be raised on sting but it just didn't happen for whatever reason in right. production but yeah here's here's a the deep cut, the uh, dagger. Baby version, had a fan. <laughs> that never, to my knowledge, was not on screen anywhere. Yeah. Um, I suppose it could have been in her horse harness stuck on the side somewhere, but I've never been able to see it. I think it can glimpse the handle, like in it, in you can see it in the scabbard in a couple of scenes very briefly, but it's never drawn or used. So yeah, it's never drawn. It is such I, a pretty knife. I didn't even see it in the scabbard, so maybe I didn't look close enough but you know same same type of process it's the decal the hand painted wood grain decal on it with the lacquer over it but it's, mm -hmm. it's a nice little pattern i'd still like to make that one day even though it was never in the film even as opposed to i am of warrior arwen of that whole idea which they abandoned <laughs> i think that's the real reason this exists i still just like it it's just a nice looking elven design mm -hmm. yes it's yeah. very pretty there's mm -hmm. a, you know, in that same vein, there's a, um, a uh, sword version. It was made for the Hobbit. I don't. It wasn't made for Lord of the Rings, but there's a sword version of this, and they actually made a prop of it. And for whatever reason, it never made it into the Hobbit films. They just decided to stick with these. But it's mm -hmm. a it's a really cool sword version of that, and I'd love to make that one day. Yeah. Well, in the book, I, I believe Legolas is described as fighting with a, a long knife. It's not a pair of knives that he uses in the novel. It's a single weapon, and it's described as I trying to remember. It's been a while since I read it, but it's a long knife. I wonder if that's where they got that idea. I, that you're I had about. the feeling that that was the reason they did it. And then for whatever reason, I guess Peter Jackson decided, no, let's just stick with what he he had in Lord of the Rings and be consistent. Right. But it's a really cool looking sword. I'd like to make it one day. But you know, after we do everything else, I guess those will be the deep cuts. We'll go back and scrape the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> uh, what else we have here? I had these out earlier, but that's the museum Andural. Or one of the prototypes. This isn't the final. Um, the this has a silver plated finish, and what we are going to do in production, or what we are doing, they're actually made. Um, it's just going to be the. Uh, you guys know that the these aren't the hilt hilt parts, the guards and pommels on almost everything. They're not steel; they're cast zinc, mm -hmm. uh, which is the only way we could do these in production. But they always had a plating on them. If it was supposed to be steel, it's kind of a nickel, what we call antique uh, nickel plating on it. And you do a little polishing on it and put a clear coat on it. And that's how most of the Lord of the Rings sword hilts are made. So they, this is that same tooling, but you can actually polish it. You don't even need to plate it. You can polish it and it looks just like steel with no plating. Mm -hmm. It will oxidize, but so will steel. So that museum collection version, that's one where, I mean, it's going to require some maintenance. If you let it sit there for a couple of years with people's fingerprints all over it, you're going to have to get some some metal glow or flits or some type of polishing compound to deoxidize it and remove that or keep it polished up or just put a wax coating on it. But we decided to go that route and try to get the same look that the movie props had where, where it looks like real steel. And obviously we have the deeper fullers, I completely redid the blade etch art because I never had a good close-up reference of the actual art when we did the first version. I do now, or I have had for several years. So I went back and completely redid that. So that's pretty much exactly how it appears in the film. It looks so much better. 
Yeah. And Especially the, around the hilt. Around the hilt, yeah, it looks... The fuller, the fuller, I think, came to about here on the original. And that was as long as we could go with the milling machine we had. But we can, we can go the full length now. So now the fuller is the correct length. So everything we could fix on that, we fixed. Uh, no gold dot, even though I do have photos mm -hmm. of a prop with a gold dot. No gold mm -hmm. in the pommel. Um, so that that's what I'm really excited about. I've been wanting to to get that done for years, and mm -hmm. I mean it's a pretty stark difference between the original and this one. This is still a great looking replica. I have no problem with it. It's just man, this is so mm -hmm. much better. Mm -hmm. Is that one uh, the the original replica you have there? Is that the unlimited or the uh, the limited version? Uh, I don't think it's either. I think it's a prototype. Oh, Probably. It's a prototype. Okay. Probably for the uh, regular edition, right? I can't remember. Did, did did the original one have gold, or did the unlimited have gold in the pommel? The unlimited has the gold runes. It's probably a proto for the because I it does have the gold in it. Okay, that's not a prop. That's a replica. That oh, the new Boromir dagger. Yeah, yeah, that looks great. Can't wait for that one. Quite nice. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to that one. And sadly, you were not able to convince them to do the scabbard for that? Uh, not with the launch. They wanted to just stay with the plaque. It's still on right. the, it's drawn up and it's ready to go. So if the dagger does good, they could pull the, pull the trigger and do the scabbard. But I don't, I don't want to do one of the, you know, like these scabbards have a, the small ones have an injection molded core. You know, we, we do a leather wrap and there's a stitch seam, but uh, we can have that scabbard made in India just like the prop, where it doesn't have to have a plastic core, just do it in thick leather and put, put the real steel fittings on it. Um, so that's, if if the knife does well and they want to do the scabbard, that's what I'm going to do is push for that. Just have it made in India and have it made to look just like the prop does. That would also keep the cost in line. Um, that's This is one... I'll see if you guys even know what that is. This is not from Lord. This is the Hobbit. That's the. Uh, it looks a lot like the regal sort of horn, but the hilt. It is. is Steely, it? Steely and Keely also had regal swords. And right, this, right. This is Feely's sword, and if if we made that, it would probably have ended up being poly resin, like the resin. like the one we did make. Um, but to give you an idea, this is a this is a challenge. This is a big challenge we had on the Hobbit swords. See how thick the blade is. Hey, yeah, wow. These these were not most of the the Hobbit props are like this. They weren't real. Most of the dwarven props, they were just sculptures painted to look real. I mean, it looks like real steel, but mm -hmm. they were all the dwarven weapons were very very thick. Well, we can't. We can't blank or grind anything that thick. We can't cast anything this long. I mean, the the, the Keely and Feely swords that we did make, I think the blades are about this long. And that mm -hmm. that was a nightmare with having warp blades, but we couldn't do anything this size. So, that, so that's what happened with a lot of the Hobbit weapons is we just couldn't, there's no way to make a real world version of it, but you can still see the artistry of the Weta guys, what they... Mm -hmm. Came yeah, up, no, it looks you know, beautiful looking sculpting, but like even that, this is supposed to be leather. This is a um, crisscross leather band with wire embedded in the top. I don't know how we would have done that had we even attempted to make a production version of this. But there's there's a lot of cool Hobbit props uh, that would have been nice if we could have made, but we couldn't. Um, it's just not too difficult. It's not difficult, like impossible. There's no way to do that one in steel, so we just dropped it. That's a shame. As long as we're on the Hobbit, we'll pull that guy out. This yeah. is Dane's helm was supposed Dane's to. Helm. This is the original one. You see what's different on it? Oh yeah, that 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 sort of a scale mill. That's not present on the on the replica, is there? It in the original footage, the, when they 
before everything was changed to CGI. I mean, it, there was Billy Connolly was in costume and he was wearing all this. This is what he looked like. And then at some point they decided to, I, I don't recall what the reasons were, but at some point they decided just to completely replace him. And when they did that, they decided to redesign it and they eliminated some of this. And they changed the coloring. The coloring is a much brighter silver on it, but I just thought that was an awesome prop. I would have loved to have seen that on screen just like this. Um, yeah, this no, is the actor scale. Nice. It's oversized, but I mean, it had all the leather. I don't know if you can see that inside, but all the oh, leather. Uh, yeah. it's good. Really well done. Yeah, it was yeah. very well done. This is real horse hair. But that's that a cool one. Think yeah. I will... Did they ever uh, actually create a, a prop for the uh, the original design? He was supposed to have an axe, and then they changed it to a hammer for they the did. movie. Yeah, they did. We were going to make it. Um, it would have had to have been polyresin because the axe blade was red yeah. stone. And it was a cool looking prop. Design. Yeah, it. Sorry. We we I wish we had gotten that prop, but we didn't because we we were already told at the time that we're, they're not doing that. They're going to change it to a. We didn't know what they were changing it to. We we were just told the design's going to change, so don't make that. But I kind of yeah. wish we had gotten the prop because I like the original designs better than what we got. I like yeah. the hammers, but I think the axe would have been better. That's just me. No, I fully agree. Here is the original Legolas bow. Merkwood bow. I don't know if you can see detailing on that. It's a it's a raised vine painted mm -hmm. gold. Um, there's some little metal fittings here with a bowstring loops under. And these are uh, look at the the detail on the bowstrings. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's not just one strand and one color. There are four different colors of thread used in it. I mean, just the detail and things like that. You will never see that on screen. You know, the actor knew that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, I just think that's a beautiful bow. So hopefully we will get to make that. It's gorgeous, movie. yeah. And what's equally gorgeous is the quiver that goes with it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And got lucky enough to get one with the full set of straps, the, the Lego scabbards go in the back here, in these holes. But that's another one where you don't know, you don't really understand that that's not wood until you pick it up because it looks like wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think these are some arrows I had made just to fill it out from a uh, a bow maker a few years ago. But here is the actual prop arrow. Real fletching on it. Well, even with a twist, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's made exactly to... like you would make one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is the one everybody wants. <laughs> no. The the replica that was made. Who made the original replica? Hollywood, um, Hollywood collectibles Hollywood. groups, the one I have, and I, and I can see that that one's it's lighter. The the pattern yeah, the, is a lot the lighter. The color on it was darker, but I actually have photos that were darker. So I don't know. If, I think they got dark if it was a screen use prop. And the more you handle these things, the darker and dirtier the paint gets. I have the feeling that may be why that's darker. But mm -hmm. this is a this is an unused prop. They did, they were making a bunch of extras, and they just ran off one for us. Because we had been asking for one. I think I got this in uh, 2009. 
2003, just before the production closed, but we, we have been trying to get one for a couple of years. So this is one of the last ones they made from the mold. Uh, but it's another one where, I mean, if you look close, you can, you can see it's not wood. That's just painted wood grain. But the all the sculpting on it, they did their best to make it look like it was actually carved out of the wood. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's another one with the, uh, look at all the strands in the bowstring. Mm. Yeah. Real Elvish rope. Well, the, uh, the the version I have from Hollywood Collectibles Group actually has the uh, the three strands of Galadriel's. No, that's, hang on. That's what Gimli got, but I think the the bowstring that uh, Legolas receives in Lorien is also woven from Galadriel's hair. Am I remembering that correctly, Kit? Uh, maybe and, Elvish hair, maybe not Galadriel's. But it Elvish does have that detail on. I don't the, remember the, it being Galadriel's hair, but that on the it would have to be some very long and very strong hair. But <laughs> yeah, it would have to be some long hair. It's just I was yeah. going to try to see if I could separate this. Yeah, it's it's so tight it's hard, but there there are two different colors of strand of alternating strands in the thread. Mm -hmm. One is kind of a, a gray brown, but there's this really fine gold thread that runs the length of it that you can only see if you're looking at it really close. It just amazes me that they somebody decided to go to that length to do that on a bowstring that you're never gonna see in the film. Yeah. That's that just characteristic of everything what it did for those films. Yeah. I don't know. One day when we have 12K TVs, we'll yeah. be able to pick that out. <laughs> Freeze frame and like, hey, there it is. And that is the matching scabbard. Uh, I wish I had all the leather to go with this one. I thought that the leather on the other one was probably the same, but it's not. It's a whole different harness. But you can kind of see some of the detailing yeah. on that. It's pretty, yeah, it's almost exactly like the one I got. I guess maybe just the paint is a little less faded. Uh, mine came, I, I have no idea who made that replica. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, Kit. Um, yeah, I do. It does come with the harness, but. Yeah, if it's the one I'm thinking of, I think I supplied him the photos of this. Right. Not very many of those around. Uh, no, and I, I really wanted to get that made with the replica, but United just they they want to stick to the wall display and the bow and the arrow. Only mm -hmm. if it does good down the road, we could go back and do this. But I had a a display design that had this and the bow and the arrow all mounted on the display because that's the way I had it mounted. Right. Um, but at least we're getting the bow. But I'd, I'd still like to get that made one day. And that's another arrow prop. That one's a little more mm. tailed. Yeah. Arrow. You know, sim similar type of uh, fletching where they put the twist in it. I think if you look, you can see the Weta get on screen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. 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 <laughs> Some of the prop, most of the props have it, but I have some of the props like the uh, the fellowship bow doesn't have any markings on it. They just left it clean, but that one added the weather the weather mark and it's numbered. But yeah, fun stuff. Very so cool. cool. Very cool. Yeah. Pieces of movie history now. Yeah. Another one I just noticed sitting over here. Oh, throw our shield. That. Love that. Yeah, with the uh, 1970s Firebird Trans Am logo. <laughs> well, now I'll it. never unsee that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the, all of those Hobbit props were supremely detailed. I mean, yeah. things you can never see in the films. Yeah. It's a shame we'll never get that. Never say never. I think I've posted photos of this on the forum. Oh, oh man. Very high. <laughs> That's cool. That one's so cool. Yeah, this is one I think we could make in real steel. 
That would be great. Yeah. I think there's a chance we'll see that one day. Uh, they want to do it. Um, it's just deciding when to fit it in and what, what they're going to make it out of. I mean, you, it could be made out of polyresin, but look, at I mean, it's plate steel. It's thin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can't, we can't do that in polyresin. It's, we would have to thicken it up so thick that I think it would change the whole look. Um, right. But it, it's, I mean, it's not easy to make this in steel, but it can be made in steel. If they can make like uh, the steel helms that we did in India, that factory can do this. This would actually mm -hmm. be easy for them to do, I think. Um, it's rough mm -hmm. leather, rough looking buckle. I, th I think we could do that exactly like this. That would so, be very cool. I think it'll happen one day. Let's see. Mm -hmm. But out of out of all the orc replicas, or the orc weapon or helm armor replicas that we could do, that and the Urukai sword that we make, that that's pretty much all I ever wanted to see. Uh -huh. so maybe one day. Did you ever think of that the the berserker sword with the two tips? Was that ever cross? We looked into your that. mind. Yeah, I mean, from the floor, that thing is it's longer than Anduril. Mm -hmm. But that tip on it is about that wide, which means your steel blank is that wide. So it's a massive chunk of steel. And so we briefly looked at it and looked, just got a rough cost on what, what the uh, cost just to make the blade and immediately kicked it out. It was going to be so expensive. Um, mm -hmm. We could do a a scaled down version. I just don't think anybody's going to want a scaled down version, like maybe three quarter size. Mm. Uh, but yeah, we did look at it. Another I think uh, spoiled by things being the correct scale. Yeah. So <laughs> the Uruk shield would be pretty cool. Um, I don't know if you if there would be any interest at U UC for that, but the the shield with the white hand, I think, would be pretty cool to see done too. We we did look at that because um, I have the prop photos. We never got a prop of it, but yeah, that's a nice, like if we do the helmet and the helmet cells, that's that's the next logical thing to do would be the shield. Because mm -hmm. you know we we all want a shield surf kit, so that's the only way we're gonna make it happen is if you make that, that one. That one would be easy to shield surf on. Uh, <laughs> this, this is a uh, this is one from my line. This this was the very first fantasy sword I did for the sword of, Swords of the Ancients line uh, back in uh, 97. This actually isn't the um, for the production version was a little different. Didn't have a handle this nice on it because uh, this one has a real leather grip. But uh, if you recall when I was talking earlier about uh, submitting uh, a proposal to the Tolkien estate to do a series of swords and knives based on the books that we got turned down on that. I mean, we were talking about Sauron swords earlier. There's no Sauron sword in the book. Probably had one. That was going to be my Sauron sword. Okay. That's what it was designed for. So I'd pitched to them a, uh, a uh, sting, a Sauron sword, uh, my version of Glamdring, and I think one other one, and they they all ended up getting made. But that's that was kind of what started my whole line off. Had I not uh -huh. tried that, this probably would have never happened. I would probably have not done a sword line. I just had all right. these cool designs that I worked up, and I thought um, we got to do something with these. So that's kind of how my line got started. But anyway, let me turn this back around. Very cool. Well, thank you. That was pretty awesome. Yes, thank you so much. That was a fun treat. Uh, I know we you've kind of dropped hints throughout this whole episode of uh, things that maybe are in the pipeline at UC and uh, things you'd like to make. And um, so I was going to ask you if there's any hints you can give us, but you've you've sprinkled in hints throughout the whole episode, you know. But <laughs> earlier you did mention. You were looking at going back to the shards of Narsil. Would would you maybe consider doing that like in a museum collection shards of Narsil? Most likely, that's what it would be if we did another one. Mm -hmm. My original idea on that was not 
a wall plaque. And I don't, I don't know if you've seen the one we made, but all the shards were permanently mounted. Yeah, yeah, it's sitting right there. Because I mean. at the time, we thought everything's got to be on a plaque. Everybody wants their collection in the same place. But my original thought was a uh, half scale shield with the cloth as a tabletop display with the shards on it. Mm -hmm. So like you see in the film, but with a scale shield. Mm -hmm. And if we do it again, that's what we'll do. Mm. People are going to hate it. You're going to have to have a special place. I mean, uh, even at half the scale, <laughs> can't even fit it on screen. It's still going to be a big shield. Mm -hmm. um, and if we don't, if we don't do it that way. It will be some type of oval display with the blue cloth. But we'll the main the main uh, difference is going to be the shards will be separate, so you'll be able mm -hmm. to pick them up instead of being yeah. permanently. But it's something we've been talking about for a few years we'll see how the museum collection line goes if the uh this enduro does well in the pipeline is next is probably sting you know we've already done a museum collection sting but if you guys recall um i'd mentioned we were looking at the blue bladed mm -hmm. a version a while back that uh -huh. didn't work out and then that whole project kind of morphed into let's just redo all of the tooling and make sting look like it's supposed to and replace the standard version you know but then i got to thinking well if we're going to do that let's we're going to have more accurate tooling let's just make that the blue bladed version and so that could be the next museum collection version so it, it would end up being on a display with a uh some type of banner behind it like mm. like the uh, mc Endural. Um, and if that does well, then maybe the shards will be next. We have a whole bunch of ideas for where to go on the museum collection, but we've got to get one out the door first. Right. This one has been in works for a long time. So I, think, I got it on pre-order. I'm excited. I don't think anybody <laughs> wants to hear about another one until this one's in their hands. So we'll, we'll just wait till that gets done. And, and they're on the way. I know they're on the way. Mm -hmm. Hopefully then, they're nice as the prototype. Yeah, hopefully. I think outside of the Peter Lyon Weta Master Swordsmith collection, that this will be the best Enduriel that a collector can get. I and think. hopefully this will be the mid grade, mid ground between the the standard production and the Yeah. Between ten thousand dollar sword. Yeah, or twenty thousand, probably what yeah, going whatever for. it is. Yeah. <laughs> the one that most yeah. mere mortals can afford <laughs> yeah what so they like what six of them or ten of them um so we have it, we have the coming uh gilgalad spear should be in before the end of the year mm -hmm. uh the boromir dagger i think is if it's not there already it's going to be at united soon um i think i mentioned the strider elven knife reissues coming uh there's a new game off the white staff which has been leaked um Oh yeah, I have that. I forgot I have that one here. Well, I'm excited for that one. <laughs> I still have that original with the metal crown, and I, I know you you can excuse yourself from that one because you said you weren't involved in designing the Saruman and Gandalf staffs. I was uh, completely opposed to that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can see the paint. Can you tell the paint finish is different? It looks really good. It's different like a from washed... the current version, or. This or, is the new one, or this this is not the final prototype, but th that's pretty close to the yeah. uh, the new one. But it, the prop head, it's kind of like a whitewashed picket fence paint finish. It's not mm -hmm. solid white. It was kind of it kind of looked faded, and you could see the brush strokes. All of the all of that white elven wood stuff that you saw in the film all had that same kind of look, mm -hmm. and. I don't know if people are going to love this or hate it, but that's how the prop looked. So that's what we're trying to replicate. Oh, I think it looks great. And Personally, by comparison to what I have, that uh, that looks All amazing. you have is the metal one? Yeah, it's good. I have the metal one, yeah. Throw that away. <laughs> eBay. I didn't even put it up. You know, I've seen people asking about the joint. Can you even see the joint there? Oh, yeah, there it is. There. We're yeah, very, bar yeah. Barely. Yeah, yeah. there it is. Yeah. Yeah, not noticeable really. I mean, you really have to come close in and to focus to, to notice it. So yeah. 
yeah, it's it's there, but I mean, on a wall or in a display, I don't think you're really going to see it. But didn't have a, really have a choice there. But I think these are on the water. I think they're coming. So maybe you'll finally get to get a good one if they come in good. I can't wait. We got a spot reserved for it. Now, I assume the little uh, wall plaque is in keeping with the newer releases, and it's not a retread of the old one. I hope. Yeah, it's not that ugly metal thing. It's actually the same. It's it's identical to one of the other ones. I think it's the same as the one in the uh, uh, not the pipe staff. I can't even remember now. I'm, I'm, the plaques are all mixed up in my head. We did three different plaques. It's identical to the one of the Hobbit versions. Okay. Um, they, they didn't want to reinvent the wheel because it already had the Gandalf rune on it. And I looked at it and I thought, well, that's already white and it's kind of matching. Let's just use that one. We don't need to reinvent another one. Mm -hmm. So we just stuck with what we had. Perfect. And then just before we go here, Kit, could you maybe explain the new kind of line you see's got the battle forged and uh kind of just explain to some some of the viewers kind of how it's different than the MC line and the standard line and and uh give your thoughts on that. Yeah, let me I think I have that. Let me grab it. Oh, great. don't have the, the final version that's that's at uc right now um so that the idea came about we've always had people wanting fully functional lord of the ring swords um you know going back to the very beginning because the i mean you guys know and these aren't functional i mean you can go out and use them but they're not really meant to be functional swords they're meant to be collectibles that you display mm -hmm. But we've always had people asking why we don't do a fully functional version with car of all of them with carbon steel blades, full tangs that you can actually go out and use. Nobody's going to use them, but there's just there's a market of people who like functional swords that collect functional swords, and they want their Lord of the Rings swords to be real swords. Mm -hmm. um, so we've kind of played around with that over the years, and we just decided to we were looking at some brass ca castings made in India one day and I don't remember whose idea it was. Um, it's probably Clint Cadell, the, the owner of United. Um, I think we were, we were talking about Lord of the Rings product development and, and that kind of popped out. Well, they can do uh, lost wax cast brass. So we could do Harugram. We could do any of the Rohan swords. And, you know, they already make carbon steel blades. So it was just something we were playing around with. And we thought, well, let's just have them make one. So this is the, the first one they made. You know, and obviously these are going to be a little rougher, more like the, the film props, because these are real lost wax cast parts. They're not perfect. They're a little bit beat up and weathered looking, which is kind of how the prop looked. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. This this is what I was talking about earlier. The original yeah. prop, this was a square corner on both sides. And then what they put in the film is they chopped that off and added this little detail here. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that's so that's what this is. It's a real wood grip, real leather. We're, we're actually looking at trying to get this uh, wet wrapped instead of see the stitch seam mm -hmm. uh, to get it exactly like the prop. Um, this one has some tweaks that still need to be made. I think the, I think we had the, we got the fullers coming to a point somewhat at the tip, but that still needs some work. And I think the grinds don't extend back like they're supposed oh, yeah. to. Two hollow grinds should go all the way inside the blade. Um, but anyway, so that that is the uh, one of the early prototypes. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know on this camera if you can see the difference so much but there's there's a visual difference in the color and real brass and plated mm -hmm. brass that'd be better if i turn them sideways yeah and there there's some details that are actually wrong on the palm on this one that were corrected on this oh, um, interesting i see the it. the lines on the pommel um yeah. are different 
Yeah, I don't know how we ended up with three lines on the one you see made. I think we had three lines because the original pommel before they chopped it had three lines. And somehow mm -hmm. we were rushing to try to correct this and redo the tooling. And somehow the lines got missed and we ended up keeping that third line in there. But what they actually made didn't have the third line. That's how I knew they, they didn't just modify the, the existing pommel on the first version. They made a new pommel. Mm. But so that the these will have carbon steel blades, you know, real spring steel blades, full tangs, peened all the way through into the pommel or through oh. the pommel. Mm -hmm. You know, That's visually cool. they're they're not that different from what the standard version looks like. So your your average collector isn't going to care about these. These are going to be for the people, those guys who always wanted your functional version. Okay, here it is. Uh -huh. So Finally, yeah. if it does well, we'll we'll do. We could do the other two row hand swords. Casting brass is very easy to do. Um, I love to do the Boromir sword to do a real functional Boromir sword, but I don't know if we can get that handle detail uh, to look right because that. Right. I, Casting and brass and casting and steel are two completely different things. Mm -hmm. So that's just something we'd have to experiment with. But this is just kind of a a first shot just to see um, how this does. And if people even like it, if they like it, we'll continue it. Test the that's waters. I, I like it. Yeah, I like the idea of it. It it yeah. looks a little bit more authentic, like maybe. Yeah, it does, it does look a lot more like the like the film prop, like the hero prop photos I have, they're more like this. Yeah, yeah. It looks just a little bit more lived in, you know, a little bit more. The standard you see is just a little too perfect. I mean, yeah, I yeah. It's almost too perfect. Scratches <laughs> in it when we did the original tooling because, you know, seeing this, this is actually a little more, like you can see it's really rough in a few places there. Yeah. I mean, that's probably a little bit too much, but Still, I like this better just because it's a real sword and I know that is a real cast brass hill. Yeah. Um, what would you say the weight difference is between those two blades? Um I did a lot of work trying to get the weight down on this. This you would think this would be heavier heavier being real brass. This is heavier. Oh this wow. Actually is nicely balanced. But nice. stainless steel has a lot of weight. Uh, it's it's more the thickness of the steel. I think the the final approved prototype, the fullers are deeper, and I think I went slightly thinner on the steel just to get the balance to feel better. I mean, it's yeah, it's a beautiful sword, but I mean, it's not a functional sword. If you were actually making a sword for a king to use in battle, you're not going to put a big junk of brass right here. Yeah, you're going to make it balance and make you're, you're going to make this smaller or at least thinner, and you're going to make this a little bit bigger so that you want everything to balance, you know, right here. So when you're mm -hmm. twisting your hand, whatever way you're moving it, you don't want to feel any stress or weight. You don't want it to be blade heavy. You don't want it to be pommel heavy. You want it to be balanced right where you're holding it and rotating it. You know, and that's always the, the trick to doing that. You, they, they didn't have to think about that when they were doing the, the film design. They were, they were probably thinking, well, we need a regal looking sword for the king. And that's what they did. And it's beautiful. Uh -huh. But, you know, in the real world, you wouldn't make something like that to be used. That would be more of a ceremonial thing. Um, mm -hmm. But still, when we're making our replica, I'm trying to make it as functional as possible. So that was something I was working on. I was trying to get the balance to feel right when you hold it. Uh, but if, if that does well, I, th I think the next one, I mean, you've already heard that the Isild Isildur reissue is dead. Yeah, so they, I was just going to ask you about that. They, about... they, we worked on that for over a year, and we just weren't happy. If we're, we, we, we always did. We decided when we talked about reissuing that, if we're going to reissue it, let's do it right because that was a new factory. Um, it wasn't screen accurate. I mean, nobody knows what it looks like on screen because you never see it up close. But it was not the hero prop. Did not look like that. That looked more like the stunt prop that I had, but you know, those hero prop photos are out there. Mm -hmm. So people know what it was supposed to have looked like. And we just thought if we're going to do it again, let's just do it right. Cause we weren't happy with the original. We didn't like the blade finish. It didn't match anything else in the line. Uh, we hated the, the grip. Um, which, so we tried retooling the grip and just 
doing all kinds of tweaks, making the fuller wire because the fuller on the original is not the correct width. Um, but we just weren't happy with any of it. And we did we didn't want to put that out if it wasn't if it wasn't an improvement on the old one. People would have been happy if we just put the old one out again who didn't get it. But we really want to make it look right. So anyway, so that got scrapped, but that's got a brass guard and a pommel. Yes. Fairly simple to make and finish. So we were talking with the factory to see, can they do real braided leather? They say they can. So we're going to try it. Ah, if they can't, nice. that'll be awesome. So that, that may be the second one after this one. Awesome. Don't hold me to that. <laughs> well, I'm still holding still, on to my original just in case. <laughs> still, yeah, dude, don't get rid of your original. It may never happen, right. but we're going to try it. Uh, one last question on that battle forged line. Uh, now, for legal reasons, do you have to sell that false edged? Uh, yes. Um, it it will have this one is actually sharp, but it'll be like we do on the standard line where we sharpen it and then we have them go over and dull the cutting part so it looks sharp, mm -hmm, but right. it's actually going to be false. So when it ships, it'll be false. I mean, if someone wants to put an edge on it, they can. Like I said, I don't think anyone's actually going to use these. I think they're, it's just for that crowd that wanted the functional one with the real full tang and the real steel. Um, oh, I think there might be a few watermelons out there that are going to yeah, pay the price. They want to, they can, they can, <laughs> they can sharpen it up and use it. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kit, for joining us. It was a real uh, pleasure and just privilege being able to sit down and your busy schedule and and just talk about this fun hobby of ours you know and uh yeah and it's been a lot of fun so thank you for coming on the show and and uh, if anyone wants to interact with kit you know come on to the uc forums there kit's quit quite the legend on there he's got a massive post count same with, with val there and you guys can <laughs> interact with them and uh We've been around uh, since 2004. I'm legend, I've just been on there forever. <laughs> forum's, that forum's been around for a while. It's one of the yeah, few that you know. the test of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you, and uh, have a good night. All right. Thanks thank so you. much, Kit. Appreciate right, it. Bye.